Education meeting back to order. Time is now 12.32 and a quorum of the board is present. State Board of Education meeting of May 10th, 2016 is called to order. The first order of business is introduction of new employees. Kyle, I think you have an introduction. Okay, we will come back. Let me know. So we're going to move to public participation in State Board of Education meeting. Uh, Marilyn will be calling people by name and then letting people know who is on deck. We have probably uh, over 100 people who would like to testify. So we're going to respect that. We're going to sit and listen to everyone who wishes to speak to us. But because there is so many people, we are going to be very uh, stringent on the time. When you see the three minutes is up, we need you to conclude so that we can respect the 99 people behind you. Um, so what we do also expect is that uh, everyone will treat each other in a professional, respectful manner. And again, I would uh, there won't be any outbursts during people's testimony, positive or negative or clapping or any of that. Let's just sit and listen to each other, respect each other and learn from each other. And so I appreciate people's willingness to do that. So where we're going to head from here is tomorrow, uh, what, what time? End of the day tomorrow is the end of the comment period. So people have until the end of the day to tomorrow to provide comment. Once the comment period closes, we'll be looking at all the comments that we have received. Uh, the committee who originally made the recommendations will take a look at all the input that we have received. We expect that to be over around 15,000, give or take, uh, comments. So it's going to take a little while to go through all of those. Uh, and people took the time to make comments, so we're going to respect that and go through them. We're going to have a very deliberate process. We're going to listen and learn from people who have presented on both sides of the issue. At the very earliest, at the very earliest, action would be taken would be August. But we will be very public and very clear that if any action is coming, when it will be presented for action. So that there's no, you know, we're going to do this very public, very uh, providing information to people about that. So again, no action until the earliest of August. With that said, Marilyn, will you please call <laughs> the first people to testify, please? Yes, you'll have three minutes. You'll be able to monitor it on here. If you've brought something written, if you will give it to the person seated at the table closest to you, they're happy to pass it around. The board does not engage in a conversation, but they're happy to hear whatever you've got to say. I will tell you who's coming to the table, and I will tell you who's next. If I mispronounce your name, please feel free to correct me. I'd love you to correct me if I do that. Okay, the first speaker is Holly Windrum, and she's coming to the table with a group, and she will introduce them. And after Holly, we will hear from Mary Bino. Good afternoon. My name is Holly Windrum and I'm the Executive Director with the Michigan Education Corps. We run the Reading Corps program here in Michigan. Reading Corps is an AmeriCorps program. We provide reading intervention to children age 3 to grade 3 throughout the state. We are planning on serving about 1,800 age 3 to grade 3 children this year. This year we were uh, very grateful to have an allocation in the state school aid budget and so today I have brought with you representatives from one of our schools. Brownell STEM Academy serves grades K through three in the Flint Community School District and two young people who have participated in the reading intervention. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Diaz to introduce herself and share a little bit about the work of Reading Corps in, at Brownell. Hi, my name is Crystal Diaz. I'm the STEM intervention teacher at Brownell. I was lucky enough to be chosen to be the internal coach for Reading Corps. And we had a great Reading Corps tutor installed this year. She's worked really hard with the kids. We had three kids have already exited the program. We have five more that should exit before the end of the year. So, and tutors generally work with a caseload of about 15 to 20 students at a time. And a student exits when, through their weekly progress monitoring, they've met and exceeded their targets for reading at grade level. <coughs> So at this time, I'd like to introduce two young readers to you. Can you tell them your name and what grade you're in? Let's start with Michael. My, my name is Michael and I am in second grade. 
Hi, My Michael. name is Aaliyah and I'm in second grade. <laughs> Michael in second grade and Aaliyah in second grade. And did you have a reading tutor this year? Yes. And what kinds of things did your tutor do with you? Aaliyah, why don't you start first? She read with us, we do sounds with her and point out words. She read with you, you did sounds with her, and she pointed out words. How about you, Michael? Uh, we read with her, she taught of us when we read, we sound out words, and if we be good, we get a cookie or a sticker. <laughs> uh, right, so she read with us, sounded out words, she timed them when reading, and if they did their reading well, they got a cookie or a sticker. I see you brought some books today. Would you do just a little bit of reading for us? Aaliyah, why don't you start? My book, is that I, my book that I'm reading is called The Story Box. Nick was eating supper at Grandma and Grandpa's house. He was going to spend the whole week there too. Have some milk in your special well mug, said Grandma. The mug, my Nick, Think about a wonderful day last year when he was with Grandpa going on a well watch together. It was for the first time Nick had ever been out on the ocean, and they spotted three whales too. Great, great job. Awesome. <laughs> okay, Michael, you want to tell us your book and read one page for us? Turtles, small. Pond. Once a long time ago, turtle lived in the a long pond in the summer. Turtle played under the tall tree one on the back. When he was tired, he rested in the sun. This is the best pond in the whole world. Turtles thought and it was. Great job. Give me a high five. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for reading to us. <laughs> Our next speaker is Mary Bino, who will be followed by Teresa Severy. Good afternoon, members of the State Board of Education. I'm Mary Bino, health consultant for Washtenaw County and Livingston County. Both ISDs for which I work are very supportive of safe and inclusive schools. I have worked with our local districts to provide professional development every year in ways to create and sustain safe and supportive schools. And every year, these sessions are well attended. Professional learning plays a critical role by helping teachers understand how a safe environment positively impacts student learning. Leaders in our area, like Craig McCalla, whom you're about to hear from later this afternoon, are faced with situations that require them to make decisions about how best to support their students. It is important that there are resources and supports for them and their districts as they face these increasingly frequent situations. It takes a lot of time to learn whether a specific situation meets Title IX criteria or not. A small amount of guidance goes a long way in preventing expensive and unnecessary litigation, and more importantly, preventing undue stress on our young people. We believe we need to provide a safe and inclusive learning environment for all youth and appreciate any support you can provide. Thank you. Next speaker is Teresa Severy, followed by Sarah Jiras. 
I was going to say good morning, but that was a long time ago. <laughs> My name is Terry Severy, and I am a counselor in DeWitt Public Schools, but I am speaking to you in the capacity of the president of the Michigan School Counselor Association. I also represent the Michigan Association of School Psychologists and the Michigan Association of School Social Workers. So I'll refer to us by letters. That makes more <laughs> sense because I'll trip over them eventually. MASP, MSCA, and MASSW, as participants in the Michigan School Mental Health Coalition, speak as one voice in support of the Michigan State Board of Education draft guidance document, Safe and Supportive Learning Environments for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgen Transgender, and Questioning Students. School, school psychologists, school counselors, and school social workers have an ethical obligation to advocate for and affirm LGBTQ TQ students. We have resources and effective strategies to minimize the negative statistics associated with LGBTQ students. While our approaches differ slightly, we work in harmony and partnership to help LGBTQ students to be empowered and supported and become visible and strong. Research clearly identifies LGBTQ youth as at risk for a number of negative outcomes. When compared to youth who are heterosexual, youth who identify as LGBTQ or those who are gender non-conforming are more likely targeted for harassment and discrimination. For example, when over 7,000 LGBTQ students nationwide were surveyed regarding their school experiences, 84% reported being verbally harassed, 40% reported being physically harassed, and 18% reported being physically assaulted at school within the past year based on actual or perceived sexual orientation. And the research is quoted. While LGBT youth, youth appear to experience higher levels of mental health and academic difficulties, school-based social situations like victimization and lack of support are frequently related to those heightened risk levels. It's thus imperative that we assist Michigan schools in adopting and implementing the SBE excuse me, guidelines which will ensure that all students receive a quality education experience and support them in striving to reach their potential. As mental health professionals, most often we are the first line intervention for all young people in schools today. Our work centers, oh there's the bell, our work centers on helping young people become responsible and respectful while always providing them a personal, social, emotional, and physical safe place in which to learn. The National Association of School Psychologists supports that all youth have equal opportunities to participate in and benefit from educational and mental health services within schools regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. The School Social Work Association of America, of America also recognizes the importance of a safe school environment for all students. The increased physical and mental health risk faced by GLBTQ students and their right to attend school without fear of threat, harassment, or denial of their civil rights. The American I'm, School I'm sorry, Council Association. We, we need to move on. I've got over 90 people that want to speak. All right, that's fine. I need you to hear us and I need you to know that school psychologists, school counselors, and school social workers speak as one voice in support of LGBTQ. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Sarah Jarris followed by Lara Slee. Here? Yes. Okay. Well, at the end at of the, the table so we can all see you. There you go. Good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Sarah Drews. I'm with the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. The coalition is dedicated to the empowerment of all the state survivors of domestic and sexual violence. And 
our mission very generally is to develop and promote efforts aimed at the elimination of all domestic and sexual violence in Michigan. I want to start by saying transgender does not equal perpetrator. And the inclusion of transgender people does not increase the risk for sexual violence for anyone. As a matter of fact, it only decreases their risk. As adults, parents, and I'm a parent to three children, educators, lawmakers, and advocates, we have no greater responsibility than to take every possible measure in ensuring the health, safety, well-being, and security of every student in every school, regardless excuse me, regardless of their sexual preference or gender identity. LBGTQ youth, excuse me, LBGTQ youth are more likely than their heterosexual peers to experience violence, specifically sexual violence, bullying, and harassment. These specific dangerous and traumatic, traumatic factors in school are the foundation for providing equal health and safety among LB, LGBTQ youth in schools and encouraging respect for all children and students. The fact is, the majority of sexual assault in restrooms is taking place in restrooms designated as men's rooms right now, or labeled as men's rooms, and it's taking place between heterosexual males. So a transgender person should be able to select the restroom that is most appropriate and feels the most safe for them, including a gender neutral restroom or a restroom labeled um, a family, uh, excuse me, all inclusive restroom or facility marked as a family restroom. So, I mean, the fact is right now with family restrooms, people of different genders and different sexual identities are already using the same restroom. Additional stresses experienced by LGBT, LGBTQ youth simply for being LGBTQ also put them at greater risk for depression, substance abuse, suicide, and sexual behaviors that put them at greater risk. Being in fear of bathroom inspection at school should not be an additional concern or limitation to their quality of education or in their education and their social learning environments. This is a basic human right of safety, privacy, and respect. Transgender people enter the restroom for the same purpose as everyone else. It's to use the restroom. And they should be able to feel safe. <coughs> as a parent of a teenage boy and two girls ages five and under, my primary commitment and responsibility is to teach all three of them, regardless of their own gender identity, general safety and awareness in all environments. in addition to basic respect for others that is not founded in fear-based homophobia and discrimination. And that's really the foundation of um, excuse me, fear-based homophobia and discrimination really is um, the basis of the argument for um, inspection in bathrooms. I, I thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate and I, I really feel bad up here because I really wish I could give you all the time everyone would like. Of course. So I apologize. I, I feel, you know, but I have to interrupt people or, we're, you know, we're already going to be here five, six hours as it is. So Thank I apologize. Yes. And I know three minutes goes by very quick. <laughs> Lara Slee followed by Jennifer and Andrew Robinson. All right. I am going to make this fast. <laughs> Hopefully you can understand what I'm saying. All right, thank you for the opportunity to comment on the guidance document regarding safe schools for LGBTQ students. My name is Laura Slee, and I've been a K-12 educator for 20 years. Currently, I help schools connect students to supports and services that will provide them with safety every single day they are in school. Also, I studied education policy during my doctoral studies at MSU, where I learned how critical it is for local districts to receive support when creating policies. I spent 12 years in the classroom, working mostly in alternative high school settings with students who were not successful in traditional schools. I work, worked with students who were homeless, in trouble with the law, addicted to drugs, and who were failing all of their classes. I cared for refugee students who couldn't speak English and had witnessed unimaginable violence. I nurtured students who had been kicked out of their homes for being gay. 
I was a constant cheerleader for students who didn't fit in and who were often tormented by their peers. The common denominator with all of these students and all of the others I didn't mention is that they need and deserve a safe space in which to learn. We as adults in the community owe it to them. That is our job. This guidance document offers schools a starting point for providing safe places in which LD LGBTQ students can learn. If we leave these recommendations unsaid, then it becomes easier to ignore, dismiss, and deny the needs of some of our most targeted, vulnerable students. This document offers the best thinking on issues ar around LGBT students and what they're facing. It takes away the guesswork and misinformation that could emerge if a district started from scratch. This document lays a solid foundation. It suggests protection from harassment, professional learning for adults to better understand and connect with students who are different from them, the engagement of families, respect for all, collection and analysis of data to identify areas that need improvement, and so forth. Recently, I worked in a high school where there was a student who identified as a female, even though her biological sex was male. Because she might be singled out for her differences, especially since some of her classmates knew her as a boy in elementary school, the administrator scrambled to figure out how to handle her situation from a record standpoint, which bathroom she should use, and other logistics that would ensure her safety. They meant well. I believe most educators want the best for kids and want to keep them safe. But they made mistakes along the way regarding her privacy and rights because they didn't have experience with this type of situation, nor did they have any direction from their district. A document like the one you are considering now would have been a tremendous help. Some girls were upset by this student using their bathroom, so they complained to a security officer. The officer said that she understood their discomfort, discomfort but then she asked, what if the student you're complaining about had to use the boy's bathroom? What would happen to her? The girls thought for a minute, then decided it was okay for the student to stay in their bathroom. They knew that she would get beat up in the boys' room. If our students can adapt to and respect differences, why can, can't we as adults do the same? Please make sure that this guidance document makes it into school districts across Michigan to help them create policies that protect their <laughs> LGBTQ students. A school that strives to provide safety for its most marginalized, vulnerable students is one that is safer for all students. That I know to be true. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer and Andrew Robinson, please. Followed by Tim Schmig. My name is Jennifer Robinson. I'm Andrew Robinson. And I am a school psychologist for a public school in Michigan. Again, my husband is a teacher. Um, but we are here today not as representatives of the school district, but as parents. Our purpose here is to express our support for the proposed guidelines and also to tell you our story and explain how the guidelines will be impacting real families that live in Michigan. We have a beautiful daughter named Gracie. She is smart, she's funny, she loves to sing and dance, and Elsa is her favorite character. Um, she also happens to be transgender. And she began showing us that she was a girl as soon as she was old enough to make choices and to choose what clothing to wear, who to hang out with, and how we referred to her. She is four years old now and is more sure of herself than either one of our other boys were at their age. She's very excited to be starting kindergarten this fall, but for us as parents, that transition brings a whole new set of fears and exposed how little we actually know about what comes next for a student like Gracie. Many people would say that that's a natural part of the transition to school and that most parents wonder what the school years will look like for their children. But the difference is that we're educators. We know the ins and outs of schools. We know how systems work. When parents and students have questions about what if and what's next, we usually have those answers. But even though we spend a combined 100 plus hours a week in a school system, when it comes to Gracie and her future and what that looks like in school, we don't know how that system will support her. We have spent hours finding out how to get the paperwork to reflect her preferred name and now what is her legal name. We've worried for hours on how the school system will protect her and keep her safe. We've thought about whether she'll be forced to play on boys' sports teams, even though she's identified and lived practically her entire life as a female. We anxiously discuss the unanticipated hurdles that she'll face just for being who she is. So far, we've been really lucky, and we work with a staff that's receptive to the information that we've brought to them. But the point of that sentence is that we had to bring the information to them. Even though there are at least five other students who identify as transgender in our public school system, the elementary school where she will be attending kindergarten was not sure how to handle this. 
They are making a priority to learn how to best support their very first openly identified transgender student, but we realize that we haven't considered every single issue that we'll encounter. We know that not every family in Michigan knows what questions that should be asked and answered because they don't spend every single day in a school. And we suspect that not every school is as supportive as ours has been. The proposed recommendations here today provide the much needed guidance for schools on how to create safe and supportive environments, not just for LGBTQ students, but for all students. It gives a minimum standard with regard to how students can, re can support and respect students within the school environment. If the recommendations are adopted, we can send Gracie to school, knowing that the school will likely have policies in place to protect her from harassment and violence. We can expect that she'll have access to groups like GSA and play sports with her female friends, and we can be assured that the school will take an active role in identifying and overcoming barriers that she may face. We can trust that she'll get the same treatment and access to educations that her, cisgenders, her cisgender brothers have, and that's all we're asking. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank Tim, you. Tim Schmig, followed by Deborah Lindner. I have Mike Reese sitting with me. I'm Tim Schmig with the Michigan Association of Christian Schools. I live in Owasso. I do want to thank you for the opportunity of being able to speak today. When the school board comes up with a policy that would, in essence, proselytize for the LGBT community, you don't speak for us. When you show a lack of tolerance for parents with legitimate concerns about the safety of their children, you don't speak for us. When you practice critical theory, questioning societal norms, you don't speak for us. When you embrace an ever-changing series of politically expedient grievances, you don't speak for us. When in a free society you would prefer that parents keep their heads down and their mouths shut about the safety of their children, you don't speak for us. When you turn classrooms into room 101 of George Orwell's Ministry of Love, you don't speak for us. When truth is debatable, but not your unproven theories for social engineering, you don't speak for us. When you ask for tolerance, which is your weakness and presented as a virtue, you don't speak for us. I think all of us should realize that we have limitations. And when you believe that by faith you have a solution in search of a problem, you don't speak for us. I am thankful that you had this opportunity to let both sides address the issue. And I would ask that you would very carefully, considerately, consider the comments that are at the website, the concerns of all of the parents in the schools, and do the right thing. I speak in opposition to this proposal that you have. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah Lind Lindner, L-A-N-D-N-E-R, is next followed by Catherine Bondi Fessler. Hello, my name is Deborah Lunder. As a Christian and a mother of three young children, I try to raise them the right way. And when I have my daughter coming to me, asking me why they want the boys to use the same restroom as her, it's a very hard subject for me to discuss because when you're trying to raise your children right and want them to be in their own separate bathrooms, when you're teaching them that way at home and then for them to go to school and have to share a bathroom, what's the situation of someone pretending they're a different gender and going in there and bullying that student that is a different gender no matter what, they're still going to be bullying. There's still going to be difference. There's really no stopping them, even if they are using the same bathrooms as others. So when I have my six-year-old looking at me and saying that people bully other people and there's nothing they can do, it's not going to stop the situation. And to teach my daughter that it's okay to use the restroom when a gentleman's in there, 
it's wrong just like I teach my, my boys that it's wrong for a lady to use the restroom when a boy's in there. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Catherine Bondi Fessler, followed by Kate Fessler. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Catherine Bondi Fessler. I'm a pediatrician and I have cared for LGBTQ youth in my practice for more than 20 years. I'm pleased to say that over the last 20 years, things are looking a lot better for LGBTQ youth in Michigan, but every single week, a new young person walks into my practice and tells me stories of how they are harassed, bullied, and often physically assaulted in their school building. Most often when I ask if they report this treatment, they say no. Um, someone once told me, I did tell a teacher and she said she was afraid she'd get in trouble if she helped this young person. While we've made a lot of progress, we're not there yet. Another piece of my job involves frequent contact I get from Michigan school districts. They have a student in their school, sometimes it's my patient and sometimes it's not, and they're looking for some guidance for me how to handle a situation with the student. And it's those instances that make it very clear to me that the guidance that you're considering today is absolutely essential. Teachers are calling a pediatrician and saying, help me figure out what to do with this youth in my, in my school. It's not enough to say that we need to have protections for all students, because we absolutely do. But we need to have special, if you will, protections for the most vulnerable of our youth. I won't repeat the statistics about the risks that LGBTQ youth, especially transgender youth, face, because I think you all know them. But they really are the most vulnerable kids in our buildings. I am not speaking officially on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics, but they did write a letter in support of this um, these recommendations. So for anyone who wasn't aware, the American Ac Academy of Pediatrics represents 64,000 pediatricians, most pediatricians in the United States. There is another pediatric organization that represents 200 pediatricians. And if you read the comments on the website, that organization is being quoted quite frequently. That's not an organization that speaks for me or for most likely the pediatrician that is the pediatrician that cares for your children. Um, I am a mother. I have three graduates of Michigan Public Schools and um, I was going to say unfortunately I have a six-year-old but poor little guy. <laughs> um, I have a lot of years left in the Michigan Public Schools and should any of my children need these protections, I sure hope they're in place. I. Um, Thank you again for making the po it possible for me to share my experiences with you and to give my patients through me a, a voice. Please, um, they need your help. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Kate Fessler is next, followed by Richard Fessler. Right here? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Kate. I'm 19 and I attended Michigan Public Schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. I have struggled with my sexuality from the time I was 12 when I confided to my best friend that I thought I may be gay. She turned around and told the entire 8th grade and by the end of the year only one of my fellow classmates was speaking to me. There were several teachers who were aware of what was going on but I, but I believe that they were so poorly equipped to deal with my isolation that they didn't know what to do about it and I went through this ordeal alone. Never let it be said that coming out, even just to yourself, is not an anguished process. None of us choose this for, the, for ourselves. But if we could change one thing about the trajectory of our lives as LGBTQ youth, it would be our orientation. It would be the responses we receive to it. And the support of even one person, one adult who we look up to and rely upon to care for and protect us, can make all of the difference. Sometimes that difference is literally between life and death. In my senior year, an editorial was published in the school newspaper. In it, a fellow student who I knew quite well wrote about gay marriage. She opposed its legalization and equated being gay to being a murderer. She wasn't at school when the paper came out, but I was, and I will never forget the impact it had on me. I was one of only a very few openly gay kids at my large public high school, and was therefore easily targeted throughout the day as people came up to me with questions, derisive comments, and quite a few gay slurs. I had one teacher, Mr. Matt Sofoldi, who got me through that year. 
His classroom was a refuge, a safe space, and the thing is that I felt lucky just to have that one place because I knew that so many LGBTQ students didn't even have that. But I should have had the right to feel safe in every classroom I set foot in. I shouldn't have had to be scared of my peers and teachers treating me differently for who I am. No student should. We are good kids and we're good students. And every teacher, administrator, and school counselor has the potential to do for their students what Mr. Spaldi did for me. Please don't let that opportunity go to waste. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Richard Fessler is next, followed by Douglas Levesque. Hello, I'm Richard. Um, and I attended Michigan Public Schools all the way up through high school. And one of my most prominent memories from my elementary school were a series of posters that we had in all of the classrooms uh, that listed core democratic values. And we were taught, they were things like uh, justice, pursuit of happiness, and equality. And we were taught that these truths are self-evident and that all are created equal. And the guidance in front of you today is a really important step to making sure that all of these values are extended to all kids in Michigan public schools. Uh, right now we have children who go to those classrooms and they look up at those posters and they know that those values don't apply to them uh, and they feel left out. Please support this guidance and help promote equally safe learning environments for all of Michigan's kids. Thank you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Douglas Levesque followed by Michelle Fox Phillips. Members of the board, I've listened all morning to all the things you have to deal with. There's a lot of issues there. My name is Doug Levesque and I'm the founder and president of the Bible Nation Society. I've been around for about 10 years here in Michigan. I've pastored for 25 years and been involved in uh, education in my community. I will be running for the State Board of Education this fall and hope to join you at this table to tackle these difficult situations. I represented the Bible Nation Society, 16,000 churches nationwide, 1,500 churches in the, in the state of Michigan, along with numerous teachers and students and communities. I would like to note that there were hundreds of people here and hundreds outside that have come to state their opposition to the Board of Education and this particular policy. Not all were able to get in the building, not all were able to speak today, but they're a representation of people around the state that are in opposition to this and we do oppose this. Our legislators spoke earlier today about where did this come from? Who was responsible for it? Where is the thinking? I believe that if you look into the thinking it goes farther back and beyond even just our national dialogue. It goes all the way to the United Nations and UNESCO. And they've been talking for years in their education wing about having universal its and transgenders and giving them rights. And I would encourage you to dive into where you're getting your rhetoric and where are you getting your strategy because I'm not sure that you really know how deep this really goes and how it uh, undermines state sovereignty and parental rights. The state of Michigan has traditionally been a great state for educational liberty and parental rights. I mean we have been at the top of the list and we appreciate that and I want that to continue. These LGBT uh, policies and ideals and analysis that you've heard today we do not concur with and we do not agree with. And there is the American Board of Pediatricians who have said that these policies, talking about gender identity, they kind of pander confusion. When children are going through puberty, it's not gender identity. And most of them that do make decisions to have hormone changes or surgeries regret that and come back. About 95% of boys and 88% of girls come back to their original born gender. And so they said that by proffering this, we're actually pushing a form of child abuse. And that's their words, not mine. So where this comes from and the definitions that we're listening to recognize that for thousands of years, 85 and 85% 85 of, Amer of uh, Michiganders identify with traditional Christian and biblical culture. And I'm here to ad advocate for that. And so what you call LGBTQ, we call immoral. The Bible calls it sodomy. That's, that, if that's bullying, then all of a sudden all the Christians are alienate, uh, alienated and you now are kind of picking on us. So we oppose this. And we ask you to consider this. Vote no. This is a political issue. It doesn't really help all the other issues that you're talking about. I wish you well. Thank you.
Thank you for being here. Thank you. Michelle Fox Phillips is next, followed by Isabel Fessler. First of all, thank you for having me here. My name is Michelle Fox Phillips, and I'm transgender, and I represent the Gender Identity Network Alliance based out of Detroit, Michigan. These guidelines are volunteer. Nobody's forcing this onto any school system anywhere in the state. These are just guidelines, which is sorely needed because the LGBTQ community and the students are in great harm. There was an issue, I've listened to some of the uh, comments that was made last week, and a lot of it was brought up about changing the name, okay, uh, without the parents' permission, okay. Kids do this because of fear of being kicked out, and there is a huge homeless youth here in Michigan because they've been kicked out because they're gay or transgender. Changing their name legally, they can get their school records changed, but if they want to just have their name called on how they identify. That is important. Using restrooms and locker rooms is important for them. And it's not to single them out like, oh, you can go to this bathroom here on the other side of the school. I've facilitated youth groups and adult groups in a trans population, and a lot of people and a lot of youth have told me very simply that they hold it because they are singled out and have to use a certain bathroom. So they hold it, and I hear it from the parents, and they just learn from their kids. <coughs> oh my, they hold it for eight hours in school, and then they have to rush home to go to the restroom. This is not right. Kids need to be safe as they go to school. I urge you to pass these guidelines for the safety of the schools, safety of the teachers, and most important, safety for the LGBTQ students. Earlier today, it was made out of 175 respondents of trans and gender non-conforming students, 84% reported being harassed, 44% were assaulted, and sexual assaults were 10%. This cannot be. We send our kids to school to be safe, to learn, and to be themselves, their authentic selves. With that, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Isabel Fessler is next, followed by Jay Maddock. You can sit at the table with her if you want to. Thank you. Um, my name is Isabel. I'm 13, and I go to a mission, Michigan public school. I am bullied every day and shoved up against the lockers for wearing a rainbow button on my backpack. I can't, I can't imagine what it's like for the openly LGBTQ youth in my schools if I'm bullied for just wearing a rainbow pin. These, these guidelines will make everybody feel safer in school. These guidelines will be a very important part of making everybody feel safe in school. And I can't talk anymore. That's okay. Just say thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much for being here. Thank you. Jay Maddock is next, followed by Michael Reese. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jay Maddock. I am from Kalamazoo, Michigan, where I have the honor of serving as the executive director of the Kalamazoo Gay Lesbian Resource Center. 
Um, prior to my role as a resource center, though, I was once a uh, teen in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I attended middle school and high school. Um, in middle school, I was a straight-A student, and my parents and I assumed that that would continue in high school, maybe pulling out a B-plus in algebra. Math never did add up. Um, and unfortunately, when I got to high school, I became a C and D student. Um, I knew that I was trans, and I did not feel safe coming out. And the taxing cost of becoming someone who I wasn't and keeping that charade up to myself and others um, exhausted me both emotionally and physically. I started skipping school because I didn't feel safe in school. Uh, when, I was, when I was physically present, I was also absent. I couldn't focus on class because I was afraid of what would happen in between classes. Um, in, at 17, I attempted suicide, um, and this is not just me. 42% um, of transgender adults um, report having attempted suicide at some point in their life. And this narrative of me becoming, beginning to fail as a student is also not just my sole experience. Um, unfortunately, uh, many students, uh, LGBT students, end up skipping school. Two, they're two times more likely to skip school than their heterosexual peers. 33% um, of LGBT students were physically harassed in just the past year because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. 56% of LGBT students reported personally experiencing LGBT-related discriminatory policies or practices at school. And I could bore you with more statistics, but I already see the eyes glazing over, so I'll continue with my role now. I get to work on a regular basis with LGBT youth. Um, and again and again, I hear them say that they don't see themselves finishing school, they don't see themselves becoming sex successful adults, because they hear what adults are saying about them. Um, and so do their peers, and that's impacting their school environment. I also have the great opportunity of working with schools in Kalamazoo County and training schools. And again and again, I hear schools ask me for guidance. They're looking for these guidance. They're looking to you to understand how they can make a more accepting and safe environment for all students in their schools. The bottom line is that the experiences we have in school build foundations for our future. Uh, and schools have an obligation to create safe and, and affirming learning environments for all of our students so that they might thrive and fulfill the highest of their potential. When a group of students are experiencing disparities in their access to quality education, it is our responsibility to respond. When students and teachers receive state-sanctioned guidelines that offer protections for LGBT students in public schools, the learning environment for LGBT students will be greatly improved because students cannot learn if they aren't in school and if they aren't in a safe environment that protects LGBT students from harassment. So it's paramount and necessary for us to pass these guidelines. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Michael Reese, followed by mm -hmm. David J. Laycock, Sr. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Mike Reese. I'm here today representing the group of people from the Mount Pleasant area. I also represent a mar much larger group of hundreds of people from all over the state who have come here today to express our view on the proposed guidance to support transgender and gender nonconforming students. Finally, I stand in solidarity with the thousands of citizens of the state of Michigan who have expressed their opposition to this proposed guidance on the Every Voice Counts website. We are here to make it very clear today that we do not in any way support bullying. But we also want to make it abundantly clear that we very strongly oppose this guidance. We also believe that the vast majority of Michigan citizens oppose this guidance as well. In my conversations with many concerned citizens, it's become very clear that while the average Michigan citizen probably does not care what consenting adults do in their bedrooms, he or she does not want an 18-year-old biological male in the bathroom with his 16-year-old daughter. The citizens of Michigan are appalled that such a guidance would even be considered, let alone promoted by this board. Statistics tell us that people identifying as transgender make up 0.03% of the population. People are wondering why this board would even consider sacrificing the safety and privacy of the 99.7% of the feelings of the 0.03%. It's already been proven many times over that sexual predators use these types of policies and laws to prey upon women. The proposed guidance states the responsibility for determining a student's gender identity rests with the student. 
Outside confirmation from medical or mental health professionals is not needed. Under this guidance, a sexual predator can on any given day declare that he identifies as female without anyone being allowed to question it. Because questioning another's gender identity would be anathema. He can then walk into any woman's restroom or locker room in the public school and, God do, and do God knows what. How are you as a board going to explain this guidance to his victims and their parents? How are you going to explain to the victims that fostering an inclusive environment for transgender students was more important than their safety? No female of any age should ever have to worry about a biological male being in the bathroom, locker room, or showering facilities with her. No female should ever have to worry about exposing herself to a biological male or worrying about being exposed to a biological male regardless of his gender identity. The guidance states that any student concerned with privacy may use a single-use facility, but my question is why should they have to? Why should they, those who are concerned about privacy and safety be made, feel, made to feel as though they are somehow unusual? I would like to respectfully remind the board that it is the parents and the citizens of Michigan who are paying your paycheck. You work for the everyday, normal citizens of Michigan, and they are vastly opposed to this. We want to make it clear to you that if this is pushed through, there will be pushback, and it will be pushback at the polls. And we'll start with Mr. Austin and Mrs. Strauss. Okay. Thank you. David L.J. Laycock, Sr., followed by Bill Wisner. Is David L.J. Laycock here? Okay, I'm moving on. Bill Wiesner? Wiesner. Wiesner. Thank you for correcting that. Dennis Cargill. <laughs> Peanut gallery. I need all the help I can get. <laughs> Hi, I'm Bill Wiesner. I'm the founder of TCFamily.org. It's a pro-family group. Uh, we've been showing videos in the 10 counties in Northwest Michigan for the last six or seven years. And uh, you can see our most recent one. It's called Audacity. Love can't, be, can't, stay, can't stay silent. It's on the homosexual issue. It's done very well. Uh, compassionate, uh, sharing the truth in love. Um, you can watch our videos if you go to TC Family or up in the media also. Um, there's really two sides to this issue. There's the God intended, one man, one woman marriage that's been with us for 5,000 years. And then there's the other side is sexual freedom. It includes fornication before marriage, which I was in part of the sexual revolution. I fell for a lot of that stuff. Adultery outside of marriage, homosexuality, and all those. Uh, one of them is like a warm fire. You can cook by it. You can warm yourself by it. It's a controlled fire. The other is more like a forest fire, and it, it's uh, uncontrollable in a sense, and it causes much pain with, uh, you know, people living separate, not married, or um, anyway, moving on here. Um, TCAPS, uh, TCAPS is a Traverse City Area Public Schools. Um, Okay, I'm going to have to really move on, I can see. Um, they have two rules. First one is safety is number one, paramount. The second one is false, it's in their manual, falsification, lying, and cheating, unacceptable. Um, both of these rules are broke. With this, uh, the safety um, by uh, Oxford study, uh, homosexual males especially lose 8 to 20 years off their life. Um, 94 and 95 percent of the new AIDS cases come from uh, in 13 to 24 year old young men come from homosexual males. Uh, suicide rate in uh, Sweden, LGBT affirming Sweden, is like 10 times the normal. It's not, not related to people both. Um, I've got handouts for you. The first one is uh, one that we've, it's from Martin Luther King Day uh, 2016. Uh, 
Michael Morris promoting homosexuality in our city. They use Martin Luther King Day to promote homosexuality. But Martin Luther King, in a letter to Ebony Magazine in 1958, he saw um, homosexuality as a culturally acquired problem in need of a solution, a habit stemming from a series of negative experiences and circumstances. Um, the second handout is an open letter to Bill Maher. You can see it on our website. Um, it's basically the history of using deception through the homosexual movement. And the third one has three parts. The real cause of homosexual desire, the fraudulent studies of the APA, and uh, the Kinsey fraud, too. I'm out of time, so there's much more on our website, and I urge you to vote no on this. Thank you. Thank you for Thank being you. here. Dennis Cargill is next, followed by Austin Creek. to live in a society today which disdains science. In America, every baby that's born is, is examined by a doctor. And at that time, the doctor determines the sex of that baby. It's written down on the birth certificate, and it's a known commodity. Today, we also consider the feelings of people, how, how they feel about their own sexuality. And that's a good thing. We should be concerned. However, we need to also note that we have gone from an object, an objectivity to a subjectivity. Subjectivity is something that is nebulous and ill-defined. So what are we to do? Uh, if, if you go ahead and pass this situation uh, with the bathrooms in our schools, it's going to spread out to other areas as well, to bathrooms in public buildings, uh, in uh, rest areas along highways, uh, could even get into sports. Uh, what if a, uh, a biological male wants to enter into the locker room of girls uh, involved in sports? If that's the case, I predict that many girls will leave sports, and the progress that has been made over decades for girls' sports will be washed away. So what should we do? How should we treat the LGBT community? Number one, we should love them. By that I mean we should get to know them, get to find out what are their concerns, what are their cares. Uh, we should protect them. Nobody should be harassed in school. Uh, just how you get to be every place at once, I don't know, we'll, we'll leave that to you. But we also have to cease encouraging them to continue in a lifestyle that has clear ill benefits for their life. There are problems uh, reported by the CDC that are physiological, psychological, and certainly spiritual as well. So if we love them, we care about them, we need to tell them that there are other alternatives. They don't have to continue down this path. And uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Austin Crute. Right. Thank you. And followed by Gina Johnson. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm representing the Allegan Pastors Association, as well as my own church, the Path of Allegan. Um, I'm also speaking as a grandfather and a college adjunct. Um, I've listened to uh, a lot of the problems that you were having in Detroit, etc. I'm very concerned with the fact that where our education system is at, that my students on the college level had no knowledge of the Constitution, let alone could not even identify one of the, um, the, the Bill of Rights. We are in a situation where our citizenry is being dumbed down considerably. Now, one of the things that I see here that you're looking at locker room situation. As a pastor for over 40 some odd years, what I have experienced is that particularly in the high schools, 
The amount of bullying that's going on is not just an LGBT problem. To present it as an LGBT problem is a sham. The other aspect of this is very simple. You have students that will not comply with this guidelines that you have in here. If you are so supportive of this, then my challenge to you is this. Shower together and let the public see your reaction of how you would be in a room with a member of the opposite sex who is not your husband or wife and then project yourself back to when you were 15 and wanting to do exactly what you're proposing here today. These guidelines not only are taking the parental rights that we have away from us, let alone the conflict that we have with religious liberty and instruction. What you are doing is imposing upon the public your own social engineering. And as one of the other speakers said, Remember, you do work for us, and we do vote for you. We are opposed to this guidelines and the way that they are. And if you continue to push these type of things, as well as common core math, kids like my 14-year-old granddaughter someday may file a sexual harassment case against not only her school, but also you as a board individually and corporately. I urge you not to pass this. It aches and hurts me to see that we have citizens that are in the LGBT community that hurt so much that they have not received the love and compassion from the churches. We love these people. We do not agree with their lifestyle, but we love them and we welcome them into our fellowships. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Thank you for being here. Gina Johnson is next, followed by Tom Coy. Gina Johnson is um, with my organization. We've agreed to, and I've also signed up, so we can eliminate one of the testimonies. If that's helpful. Right. Okay. And right what's your name, and sir? My name is William Wagner. William Wagner. I'm right. president of um, the Great Lakes Justice Center, which is the legal division of Salt Lake Global. And we're here on behalf of um, parents and grandparents and children. And, and what I'm not going to talk about uh, is the medicine, um, the science. The science is out there. Uh, the medicine uh, is out there. The evidence is out there. There are a lot of comments and appeals to motion today. As an, when I served as an academic, my question when I always heard somebody appealing to a motion is what is the basis for <coughs> your statement? What is the basis for your unsupported conclusion? And there's a lot of um, allegations today uh, about the risk uh, that, is, that is evident um, or apparently evident to the LGBT community. Again, I think it's really important uh, that you look at the studies that they're citing, uh, look at the lack of methodology, look at, um, and, and more importantly, um, ask what is the basis uh, for, for these conclusions. What, what I'm here, though, today uh, is to talk about the law and good governance. Uh, the reason that you see hundreds uh, and hundreds of parents uh, and grandparents and children out here today uh, is because, first of all, they didn't feel like they were given uh, a, a fair notice, and now when they were given notice, this is the result you know, that, that happened. Um, but more importantly, we all care and support your goal of promoting a safe and supportive, inclusive and boring, uh, learning environment for all students. Uh, the last speaker, I can sympathize and understand what, what he was saying. We, we love all these students and we care very much about them and we are very, very much against bullying and, and we would be supportive of you know, a, a, a different kinds of strategies to, to respond to that. But the approach that you are taking, um, I, I'm going to suggest, and, and we have handed out our, our written testimony, uh, which covers uh, all of what I'm talking about in much greater depth. Uh, the approach that you are taking is going to lead to uh, greater risk and greater violence. But more importantly, the approach you are taking uh, is violating the Constitution in so many ways, I, I couldn't begin to t provide all the testimony in over an hour if you gave it to me. 
not only are you violating the constitutional fundamental right of parents to control the upbringing of their children, you're violating the due process clause of both the Michigan and state constitutions. You're violating the free speech clause of the United States Constitution. You're violating the free exercise clause of the United States Constitution. You're violating the Obergefell new constitutional right of personal identity for the students that identify as something in, from some other place other than their sexual identity. Many, many, um, most, many people find their identity in some place other than their sexuality, for example, in their faith. Uh, I'll give you one example and then I'll leave. Um, you have made illegal conduct that occurs only after the conduct occurs. And due process at the very least requires notice of what is wrong. And yet a person says something, it's legal, somebody perceives it later as a harassment, now all of a sudden that conduct has become illegal after the fact. That violates the very, very basic uh, due process that, that our country has stood for for over a couple hundred years. Um, I leave it to you and, and submit the written testimony uh, as, uh, as our position. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. Though. Thank you for being here. Tom Coy is next, followed by Nahal Patel. Hello, thank you uh, for this opportunity. I'm with an organization called Michigan Free Speech, and we believe that uh, same-sex privacy in the locker rooms and bathrooms is a civil right. It hasn't been, had to been articulated because it's been understood for so long. I'm going to take the rest of my time to speak to you as a researcher. I've researched uh, the professional division over homosexuality for 12 years, and um, your 10 and 10 goal, the key to following that, you have said, is to use evidence and data. But from reading the proposal, your evidence and data seems to be coming all from the LGBT community. And sadly, the APAs, the American Psychological and American Psychiatric Association, many other counseling associations are dominated uh, by LGBT political views. They've actually, they're more political in some areas than they are professional organizations. From my research, I can tell you that there's 100 years of clinical evidence that shows that uh, most cases of homosexuality are a symptom of a psychological disorder and it includes a gender identity disorder. It's been considered a disorder for many years up until the last few years uh, and for political purposes it's not anymore. Uh, the health risks, people have been talking about the health risks. Um, the school board has programs to prevent uh, students from smoking. The chances of getting lung cancer from smoking are 20 times greater if a, if a youth smokes. Uh, for homosexuality, male homosexuality, the chances of getting syphilis are 70 times more for male homosexuality. The chances of getting HIV infection is 100, over 150 times more. These are using CDC statistics. Um, we've talked about suicide too, and there's many uh, Psychiatrists and counselors have found that uh, the suicide is not from societal pressure, but it's from the factors that cause the homosexuality. Um, the causations of homosexuality and these gender disorders have a lot to do with rejection and trauma. So there's a lot of compassion that's needed, which this board has shown. Um, there's 60 years of evidence that homosexuality, in many cases, unwanted homosexuality, can be changed to heterosexual adjustment. Also, gender identity disorder. I mean, the younger you start, the more able you are to help these uh, young people who are confused in their gender identity. In your program, your proposal, you also say that 8.4% of students identify as LGBTQ. Um, many surveys, including the Kinsey survey, says that uh, most people who have that identity in your youth do not have that in their adulthood. Uh, realistically, less than 4%, maybe 2% of that 8.4 will identify that in their adulthood. How you handle this issue will mean whether more identify that in their adulthood and have those health risks, or if less identify in, with uh, that identity and have a more healthier lifestyle and, and possibilities. Thank you. Thank you for I being Also, I, I prepared a paper that I uh, submitted, faxed. Um, I faxed it to you, and I'll right. give it to your... Nahal. <laughs> 20 journal peer-reviewed references and 24 references from uh, psychiatrists. Thank you. Thank you. 
Nahal Patel, please, followed by Reed Nelson. Thank you for your time, board, and uh, and uh, I. Uh, there's been many things that have been covered already that I was going to cover, and I, I'd just like to start with the story. Uh, the story is uh, one I had heard in India many years ago of a mayor of a town who had a ship of refugees uh, come to his shore, and the refugees gave the mayor a glass of milk and as an offering to say, we'd like to live here with you. <coughs> and the mayor returned the glass of milk and said, we can't accommodate you. Um, I'm sorry. And then the refugees decided to mix some sugar in the milk and gave the milk back to the mayor with the message, just as the sugar mixes with the milk, so will we mix with you, only to make the milk sweeter than it was before. And the mayor was touched by it and decided to accommodate the refugees, and uh, the story ends very happily. I have seen successes uh, in our schools, in some of our schools, and heard about successes nationwide of LGBTQ children being uh, embraced by their classmates. So many uh, examples of LGBTQ and non-LGBTQ uh, students giving support to each other. And it's uh, amazing. I have learned so much, uh, especially from the non-LGBTQ classmates and friends who have supported and embraced their use of the bathroom of their gender identity or, um, or being able to make accommodations in a locker room, for example. It's that type of love and acceptance that grows and, and heals uh, and provides a positive environment for, for our students. And uh, I've, I've seen this in our schools. And I, I thank the board for coming up with voluntary uh, guidelines uh, to, to help schools uh, manage the issue. Um, I, with the time I have left, I'll just say uh, in, I only speak on my own behalf uh, today. But as I've been looking at the issue, I've been uh, curious, I've looked at crime data, and according to Human Rights Campaign, 2015 had more murders of transgender people than any other recorded year. And in contrast, uh, at least in my own experience, seeing and reading about uh, places where uh, children of sec various se sexual orientations and gen gender identities are able to use the restrooms that they're comfortable with and so on, I haven't yet heard of any such rampant uh, aggressive uh, type of conduct at all. It, it seems that the, uh, the hard data I, that I've run across is showing that the, the data that LGBTQ children are facing bullying, harassment, and sometimes uh, even the, the worst of situations of murder um, is, is something that we do need to be concerned about. There, I'm glad to share information, uh, but there are lots of studies over the last five or ten years showing us that hormones, genes, and other things at birth are determining gender identity and sexual orientation. When our students talk to us, they really are telling us who they are. And I thank the board for showing support. And let's, to my friends here and everybody else, let's not be afraid to taste the sugar. Thank you. Thank you for thank being you. here. Reed Nelson is next, followed by Jasmine Early. Reed Nelson, graduated from Fraser High School in 1972. My wife from Mount Clemens in 1972. Have four children that all graduated from Mackinac City Public School, and uh, they're all a blessing, and I'm grateful for them. But I have nine grandchildren, some not yet in school, some will be in school. It was interesting to listen to the program earlier on the need for nurses, the problem with asthma, poverty problem, and yet I somehow see that that's not the solution but the problem there, I think, is the same problem that we're dealing with with the bathrooms. Maybe you don't put the two together. But somehow I do put them together. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, Let us make man in our own image. And then in verse 26, 27, it says, So in the image of God made he him, male and female, made he them. And Jesus Christ made male and female. Nobody has to accept that. But that's what I believe is the truth. I believe this to be true also of Jesus, that Jesus made this clear. He said, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Not once, but twice in that verse it says, a man shall leave his father and mother. That makes a family. 
and cleave to his wife. And they too, that man, that woman, become a family. I really believe that the problem in Detroit is not a need for nurses, but the problem is there's not a man and a woman in the family. 41% of our families in America are without a father. Listen to Tony Evans, who's a black preacher, and he said, if you're black, it's 72% are without a man in the home. And to me, that's the greatest problem that brings the poverty and that brings the disorder in the family. And if we could get back to building a family after God's order with a man and a woman, that would solve a lot of problems. And, and I guess that's, that's one of the first things that bothers me about this proposal that you have. It's eliminating the thoughts of the parents. Letting children do something that the parents may not know about. To me, the parents should be the first one that's addressed. And the parents should know because that's the hope of that child. He's got to come home to mom and dad if there's a mom and dad. I greatly appreciate what you are trying to do. I appreciate your work. It's difficult. But as I said, I owe it a lot to the school that I went to and my children, and I have grandchildren coming. And I just wish you would consider the fact of the problem is our families. We need a man and a woman in a house, and that's the way it was designed by God. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. The next speaker is Jasmine Early, followed by Sine Elias. Thank you. I'm here to represent hundreds of parents for Sterling Heights. English is not my first language, so bear with me. I'm here to express our opposition to the guidance statements regarding the LGBTQ. It guidance takes parental rights away and put at risk the safety and emotional being of our children. I love homosexuals, and I believe that at God's creation, we all should be tolerant to each other. However, I firmly believe that the left, through liberal agendas, is trying to discriminate the people who don't follow their agenda. I'm a minority, I'm Hispanic. I also am a Christian. I had experienced what is to be bullied and discriminated, but I also know that we had anti-bullying laws and we had anti-discriminating laws that protect us. That is what the Constitution is about. Why more? Where is the privacy and safety? In this very moment, straight students are facing what is to be intimidated in schools. Who is talking about? They are being isolated. It is clear that through this guidance, you are trying to indoctrinate the young generations so this will become the new normal. Students in schools, in a school age, do not have the maturity to deal with the emotional confusion that you are trying to create. I'm highly concerned the way the guidance states what is gender identity. Are you telling us that a five to 10 year old child may already be having this type of maturity to make those kind of decisions? At this moment, we may have a confused young society as a result of the media, some schools and government officials pushing to indoctrinate our youth and discriminate the ones who uphold different moral and standard values than you do. Are you telling us that you know better than us, parents? Instead, trying to create an unsafe environment for the total of our children, which certainly are no a solution for the few children that struggle with gender identity, you should be focusing on researching the proposals that are working within our state and are protecting 100% of our children. When children come to school, parents expect that teachers will be educating, protecting, and guiding in academics their children. We parents do not want you to get into the business of teaching children to live a double life in a school since you are taking our parental rights away with this guidance. That is not right, it's wrong. This double, double life will only create more problems besides any health barrier related to learning problems that they may already have. I plead to you for the emotional and safety being of the children. Do not even try to pass this guidance. If you are doing it because an election year, I want to remind you that for that same reason, 
you may be worried out. Furthermore, you are going to be accountable to God one day, whether you believe in him or not. I pray that you will have an answer for him. I do have petitions here that many have signed, and I could have gotten more signatures. But school officials made sure that I will not be able to inform or ask parents to sign it. Should the parents know about it? I ask you, who is being, being bullied or persecuted now? Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Sine Elias is next, followed by Gary Wanak. Thank you. Good afternoon, board. My name is Senna, but I appreciate it. I accept uh, anything close. No, <laughs> I'm glad you tell us the correct pronunciation. That's fine. Um, basically, I just want to share a few things. Um, when we make sound judgment, sound policies, we base them on facts and objectivity. I understand emotions, but we don't base them on feelings and emotions because those are subject to change. Now, we've heard many young people who have been bullied, and I feel for them. I've been bullied when I was young, not because I'm transgender, or just because I stood out, I was skinny, I was foreign. People make fun of kids all the time. We currently have anti-bullying laws. Why aren't you utilizing that? instead of trying to create another law that will definitely go against the majority of students' rights and privacy. No one's saying to these young people that they can't have a safe place to go to use the bathroom. We are suggesting that you create a separate one because those children who are 99.7 percent uh, should also have the same respect. They should have the right to feel private, uh, have privacy in the bathroom, they should not feel they're marginalized because they don't agree with the agenda that you guys are proposing because that really is an agenda and it is going to marginalize them because if they don't follow through with that, they are going to be criticized and possibly uh, subjected to some uh, admonition from the teachers. Who knows? All I'm trying to say to you is, first of all, you're usurping the parental rights. A parent has a right to direct his, his children's direction in life. He's the person who is to lead them spiritually, morally, in every way. You are not responsible for that. By you indoctrinating in the curriculum, starting from kindergarten to 12th grade, allowing this to be taught. So you're telling a child who's five, six, seven, eight, if you feel like a boy, if you're a girl, and you feel like a boy, maybe you should try it out. Maybe you are a boy. What kid at that age is able to make any decisions such as that? We don't give them a pill without a parent's approval. We don't allow them to take a, a bus trip without a parent's approval. But you're saying that child without parents or a mental health doctor can make a decision? You guys are either living in a la-la land or we need new board. Thank you for your time. All right, before we call the next person, we do have that new employee. No, we don't have the new employee. Mm -hmm. Apparently he's on his way. Okay. We'll continue then. <laughs> Gary Warrock. Warrock, yeah. Thank and you for your time. Mike Stevens is next. Sorry. It's okay. Thank you for your time. I stayed with relatives last night. They are both educators. They both graduated from Michigan State. We don't have the same worldview. Um, we were talking about adoption, and they had seen adoption with same-sex parents is, is working out. I disagree with the premise. However, when it comes to what this board is proposing on the transgender issue, they figure this is something that they are handling now. As a matter of fact, one of them deals with two transgender students out of 132. And my question to you is, you're going to take one person and put them in a population of 60 others where the sexes are different and they're going to feel make them people feel uncomfortable. My wife and I have well, he's my brother-in-law. My wife's brother is mentally retarded. Now, you're telling me, because every now and then he has an issue for acting out, that I'm going to take a whole community and make them say, well, you're going to have to suck it up when he gets a little out of control because he has a problem. The also thing you need to take into consideration is this, this topic we're talking about is referred to as gender, gender dysphoria. 
and it is listed in the DMSs from three, four, and five, and I know this because my wife is a therapist, and she deals with closed head injuries, and she has pointed me to this stuff. And I, I am asking you to think about what you're doing, because you are asking to turn everybody else's worldview upside down for a small percentage. You've heard it was percents, percentages under 1%. I'm willing to give you two on the on the information I got, and I, you know, we don't do that for anything else. Why would we do that for this? We do need to treat these people with love because that's what we are called for, and and to not bully them. I agree with that, but there are other accommodations, and I think our teachers are intelligent enough to know how to handle this in school without somebody coming down with a one size fits all law from from the Board of Education. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Mike Stevens is next, followed by Jamie Ramsey. I am Michael Stevens, <clears throat> retired physician. <clears throat> I completely disagree with this thing. It would be against the great majority of more normal people and as a previous person said, there is a lot of psychological abnormality in the people that are involved in this. <clears throat> we need to educate all of the youngsters about them um, to try to cut down some of the fighting and stuff that goes on when they're young. But it is absolutely not correct for anyone with a penis to walk into a ladies' bathroom. <clears throat> that is not right. If they have their penis removed, then they can. But that is, this is an absolutely wrong bill to allow that. Thank you for the time. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Jamie Ramsey, followed by Mike Reese. Is there more than one Mike Reese? Yeah, I would be just Okay. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for hearing us today. We're here because there is a beautiful kaleidoscope of gender that we all have access to. Our body parts do not dictate who we are and how we express ourselves. We also know that bullying and discrimination do not make for healthy, productive people, and that loving acceptance and support does make for healthy and productive people. Protecting students who don't conform to the gender binary is something that all compassionate people can get behind. We've also seen a lot of anger and fear over this issue, and I believe that stems from the fear of the unknown and fear that other children might get hurt due to the protections for trans and gender nonconforming people in our communities and our schools. These protections won't harm other students. LGBTQ youth face discrimination from classmates, from their parents, from their communities and from strangers just for living and existing as who they are. We've all been taught to fear something that we don't know from a young age. And that fear leads to anger, especially when it's something that we don't know how to understand. But that doesn't mean that those who are angry or fearful of those who are different are right. And all children need protection, especially gender and sexual minorities. Lesbian, bisexual, gay, transgender, queer, questioning, and intersex youth are at much higher risk for depression, anxiety, and suicide than those who are not gender or sexual minorities, in large part due to the lack of support and open discrimination against their right to exist and live their lives without unnecessary hardship and distress. Some of the concerns that were brought up were that students who are not transgender might cross-dress to gain access to the opposite gender's restroom. Being trans involves a lot more than suddenly deciding to wear a dress to school and using the opposite restroom. It's about the fundamental identity of the person whose genitals don't match up with what society deemed their gender at birth to be. And any young person suddenly assuming a different dress to ogle other young persons while they void bodily waste in the bathroom needs professional help. Educators available, like Jay Maddock from the Gay and Lesbian Resource Center, uh, or there are educators available to help schools come up with policies to address the needs of transitioning uh, or gender nonconforming students. 
In closing, please choose to protect all students, especially those who are at the most risk for discrimination and their gender identities not being respected. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Michael Reese is next, followed by Nicole Edelman. Just so you know, I started my education in a Bible college. I'm a pastor, Calvary Baptist Church in Midland, Michigan. But I then went to Central Michigan University, got my degree in education. I've been a teacher. I have a doctor's degree. All I'm saying to you is that I do not envy your position in the field of education. That's where I live. That's where I came from. I just say what you have in front of you is a very emotional situation. Um, I believe the difference is, and a couple of people have addressed it, there are different worldviews. My worldview is based on God's Word, the Bible. There are other people that would have a worldview that's totally different from that. And I want to tell you, as a pastor, that doesn't make them bad. That doesn't, I don't believe that they're trying to do bad things. Nor am I, and nor are we. But it's a different worldview. I believe that God created man and woman, and there is a difference. There was then, and there still is. In our church, we have a number of families that homeschool their children. Others choose to put them in our private Christian schools, and others choose to have them in the public school. And we have a number of them that have them in the public school. The one key ingredient there is it's a parental choice. They have that choice. And as I read through and studied your proposal, I, my main concern is the taking away of parental knowledge and parental authority. And that's my concern, and that's what I ask you to consider. I ask you, elected official, to consider the rights of our parents. Don't make this a state mandate. Leave it up to the individual public schools to be decided on by the parents in that school district. Because I believe, the Bible tells me, understand that's my worldview, and I'm not preaching at you. Please understand that. You can have a different worldview, and that's okay. But this is why I'm saying this, because of my worldview is based on Scripture. And it says children are in heritage of the Lord. They're given to us by God, and it's the parent's choice to see where their children are educated and how their children are educated. And when I read through your guidelines or proposed new policy, you've hit almost every area, which you would have to do. You've hit almost every area, including the library and what's there, including the guidance counselors that are there and how they're going to guide them, including the restroom, the locker room, the interscholastic sports. You've hit it all. I say that's a parental choice. Leave it to the local school district and I do not envy your position. And I made it less than three minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. You get extra credit points. I'm not sure what you can do with them. But. <laughs> Nicole Edelman is next, followed by Benjamin Bright. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I'm, my name is Nicole Edelman. I'm the parent of a Michigan public school student, and I am the executive director of the Corner Health Center in Ypsilanti, Michigan. The Corner Health Center commends the State Board of Education on the development of the document Safe and Supportive Learning Environments for LGBTQ Students. The Corner Health Center's mission is to provide judgment-free, high-quality, affordable health services for young people aged 12 through 25. Our recently revised mission was developed with the assistance of youth on our board and our Youth Leadership Council. It was their strong suggestion to put the qualifier judgment-free first, before high-quality and before affordable. Youth often feel judged and need their health provider to be a safe space, just like they need their schools to be a safe space. While this is true for many youth in general, the coroner is continuing to see an increase in LGBTQ young people seeking medical care and mental health services. Nationally, LGBTQ youth report bullying, suicide attempts, depression, anxiety, HIV, STIs, and unintended pregnancy at higher rates than their heterosexual peers. The American Academy of Pediatrics, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and other government agencies and medical and health professional groups recommend providing programs that are inclusive of LGBTQ youth, decrease disparities these youth experience, and emphasize the need to support their health and access to care. The U.S. Department of Ed has released guidelines that public schools must protect all students, including LGBT students, under Title IX. This includes school staff being LG educated about the LGBT community, identifying a staff person to represent and to respond to harassment complaints, and co prohibit discrimination against LGBTQ <coughs> students. Clarification states a school with a hostile environment that does not address this environment is violating Title IX. 
and further clarifies a school should not wait to take steps to protect its students until students have already been deprived of educational opportunities. All students should feel safe and supported at every Michigan public school. The document under discussion is not a mandate, but a framework listing recommendations, best practice, and research-based guidance on how to create safe environments for schools as they make policy decisions. As a health care center for young, young adults and adolescents, the Corner Health Center, including our Youth Leadership Council, endorses the, the adoption of this document that encourages safe and supportive environments for LGBTQ youth. This fosters healthy youth who will in turn grow into healthy adults. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Benjamin Bright, followed by Craig McCalla. And good afternoon. I'm not representing any organization. I just a uh, father of four uh, young children, so this is not uh, staring me in the face yet, but uh, coming in the future. And uh, one of the stated goals of the, the guidelines that uh, you're proposing is the safety of uh, LGBTQ students, and that's something I strongly agree with. Um, nobody should be subjected to harassment or bullying or insulting of any nature, and uh, that's something that I think many people can get behind for sure. Uh, but there's some other things about it that are troubling, and uh, nothing that hasn't already been addressed, so I'll be brief. But the, the locker room and restroom situation is uh, troubling to me from a couple different uh, aspects, but um, the decisions that are made here, of course, are going to affect many, many people, and there are likely to be unintended consequences of those decisions. And uh, there are many students who have concerns about um, that uh, the mixture of uh, biological genders in one room, um, and not necessarily uh, lighthearted concerns, but convictions about modesty and what's appropriate and so forth um, without any ill intent toward anyone else. Uh, also, has been mentioned as well, the parental involvement, which is just crucial in my view. Uh, an issue like this, where there's confusion, uh, perhaps, uh, emotion, um, there needs to be the wisdom of the older generation, especially the parents, brought to bear on a situation like this. And uh, it would be a, a travesty to keep them out of the loop. And at least a surface uh, reading of this document indicates that there are some restrictions put in place with parental communication about uh, these issues. Very troubling uh, to me. And then finally, uh, it's been asked already, uh, what is the source of these guidelines that, you, uh, that the board is considering? And I would respectfully request that if you have not done so, could you please seek out uh, input from other qualified individuals and organizations uh, which may offer a counter perspective uh, to what you've got here. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Craig McCalla is next, followed by Beth Josephson. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Craig McCalla. I'm an elementary principal. Um, I'm here today to speak in support of the guidance and um, the guidelines. Part of, as a building administrator, a lot of people have talked about keeping our students safe. Um, we, we work on bullying policies um, and following those policies each and every day to keep our students safe. What these guidance policies do is give us that direction of how to support our students. I talk to administrators, superintendents all over the state of Michigan, and a lot of times they have questions, what can we do to support our students? Um, we have conversations. I have two transgender students in my building. I work very closely with their families um, to make sure it is a safe and supportive environment for them. These students are flourishing. Other people have found out what are you doing, Craig, to make these students safe. Um, and these guidance policies are give them that latitude of moving forward. I encourage you to um, pass these policies and these guidance policies. Um, they are nuts and bolts to keeping our students safe. We had one of the students that was out there, um, can't come in, um, but they asked me to speak on their behalf. And I think that as a building principal, it is my, I'm a voice of the students as well, the families and the children. Um, one of the students was here was Aiden. Um, he spoke at an earlier meeting. Um, he was the AP student and trumpet player. Um, and he just wanted us to remember that all the kids who have tried to take their own lives and to support them. And what these policies do, um, when you look at the data, it keeps them safe. Um, it makes it safe and secure environment for them. They feel comfortable at school. So I encourage you to, to pass the policies. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. 
Beth Josephson, followed by Sean Kennedy. Thank you for allowing me this time to speak. My name is Beth Josephson. I'm a sorry. I'm a guidance counselor at Okemos High School. However, I'm not a spokesman for the district, and I want to make that clear. They probably don't even know I'm here. Took a personal day. <laughs> I've been an educator for 26 years. I work passionately every day, probably overworked for my near 400 students. I learn from them. I engage with them. It's just such a tremendous job. I don't bring my religious, personal, political views to work. I bring a listening ear, sensitivity. I protect them. I advocate for them. I do not judge them. Today, I've heard enough of that judgment. These guidelines, you passing guidelines, will actually save lives, young people's lives. I want to acknowledge that I'm proud to be a Jew, a daughter, a dog lover, passionate guidance counselor, athlete, educator, and a lesbian. I live my life authentically, and I have for 15 years. I'm almost 50. That means 35 of my years. I was not, because of societal views and my worry of losing my job, maybe my housing, not getting and still not being protected. So today, I want to share some stories of students. I'm not going to use their names, but I will use names. Eli, the transgender 15-year-old. Legal name, Emily. Bravely, Eli asked teachers to use a preferred name, Eli, but also pronouns, he, him. The teachers at Okemos High School, the public school, Okemos Public Schools, are amazing. They want to help students. Everybody was on board but one teacher, honestly, with best of intentions, always said, do your parents know? Eli said, one does, my parents are divorced. That teacher asked Eli to get permission from both parents in order to honor that request because they, the teacher, had a friend who this happened to and it hurt their friend so much that that teacher brought that personal story in and when that student left that class, they told me, Eli, that he thought the world hated him. Due to the statistics that we have, Eli could have been a casualty. Is that what we want? Do we want to impose judgment, personal views? Do we really think that transgender, non-binary students want to go into a bathroom to do the things, the horrific things that I'm hearing? No, they want to go to the bathroom. They're kids. They want to use the restroom. And they will leave school without going to the bathroom. If a student is not emotionally available to learn, to be there, they will not engage. Their emotional and their safety, and it is my job to keep them safe, to have them engage, to graduate with statistics like their peers who are heterosexual, to not live in fear. I have so much more to say, but I will stop it to respect everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Sean Kennedy, followed by Christopher Yeager. All right. Thank you, board, for allowing me to speak today. I thank you for your service to our state and appreciate the hard work that you have to do before you. Um, I come as a father, I actually have nine children, uh, me and my wife do together, and we're blessed. I um, also come to you as a youth pastor for about 15 years. Um, and I have students and parents coming to me that have heard of this issue, um, and they have concerns. They have concerns about parental rights and the whole bathroom, locker room situation. And um, 
I stand for you today and say a policy, passing a policy isn't going to change necessarily um, the reaction of, I know I've heard, we've heard testimony today of somebody that uh, beat up in a restroom. I think the, or I know the, the key to that is respect of man, your fellow mankind. It's not a, it's not an issue of, of that, but respect of mankind. And I, I only say I think we're going to open up a Pandora's box of problems by passing the policy as it is. And I would just ask you to reconsider this policy. Um, it just may move that, that unfortunate and tragic um, bullying of a student to another location. All right? Not this, and so this, I don't think it's the solution. I think definitely uh, we do need to support the safety of all of our students. Um, but I don't think this policy is it. And I ask you to reconsider, and, uh, and I appreciate the your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Christopher Yeager, followed by Matt Anderson. And Matt had to leave, just so that'll save you some time. I appreciate that information. <laughs> no problem. I'm Chris Yeager, Swartz Creek, Michigan. Um, I want to start off with a story. Um, I graduated from Grand Blank High School um, a long time ago, feeling like a long time ago, 1993. Uh, between my 15 and 16 year birthday, between my sophomore and junior year, I made a cognizant decision that changed my high school experience um, for the next two years. Um, walking in my junior year, I was made fun of, I was bullied, I'd have my books, I didn't carry a backpack, I carried my books in my hand. I had my books knocked out of my hands. I had my teachers tell me that I can't do what, I'm do what I was doing. Um, I was, I was started and wanted to do an agenda with, uh, with my class at graduation. I was, I was knocked down because it couldn't be supported. Um, in every way, shape, or form, I was marginalized, abused, mentally, never, ver never physically, but mentally, um, uh, socially. And you know what? I'm not transgender. I'm not LGBTQ. I carried my Bible to school. But I didn't go running to my principal and saying... <coughs> I, I, I'm getting beat up. I realized when I take a stand for something that I believe in, there's not going to be everybody that's going to agree with me. Not everybody's going to look at me and say, I do what you do. When you take a stand for something, you recognize that there's a great majority that doesn't want anything to do with you. My friends, didn't want to eat lunch with me. I ended up eating lunch and, well, didn't eat lunch. I went to the library because, and sat through lunch class because all my friends rejected me and I got made fun of all through lunchtime. Hey, there's the Bible guy. Hey, why don't you preach to us? Hey, hey, where are you going? What are you going to do? You going to stand up? You going to make us Christian? I, I got it all. Affluent high school. If you're familiar with Grand Blank, Grand Blank and uh, just outside of Flint is an affluent area. It's not just, be, it's not poverty, it's not, it's, it's affluence, it's everything. Listen, I, I reject the proposal because here's the reality. If they're going to make a stand, realize that when you make a stand for something, you're going to get made fun of. And for somebody, for us to sit there and say, well, we're going to protect this group, but yet we're not going to continue to protect somebody in this area or this area or this area, I just think it's you're discriminating against one for the acceptance of others. If we want to say that we're going to do, not to discriminate against, not to discriminate against all, but make it fair for everyone, listen, we've got to realize that lifting up one group marginalizes a whole other group. I didn't expect everybody to carry their Bible. I didn't expect everybody to accept me. But you know what? I was going to take a stand. And maybe that's what we need to let the students do is, if that's what they believe, let them take a stand. So I'm just and stop trying to legislate everything and make everybody do whatever we want them to do. Sometimes taking a stand costs. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you.
Erica Spitzfaden, followed by James Tuffle. Is Erica here? Is James here? Erica's here. Oh, Erica. I'm sorry, I didn't have access to the list, but. Uh, my name is Erica Spitzfaden. Well, not legally, not yet. It's a process if it takes time. I'd like to tell a story, my story, about how I came to terms with being transgender and about coming out at work. Uh, I'd like to tell you that I always knew, but it wasn't like that for me. I knew there was something, I just didn't have words for it. I remember stories of my father saying that he didn't want his boys to having dolls. He didn't want them growing up sissies. I remember as a teen making myself earrings and skirts never really feeling comfortable in my birth gender. Not sure that my friends or parents would understand and not having the words to express what was wrong. I kept it to myself. I tried to bury it. I met someone special, I got married, I had kids. But it was always there. As time went by, I found more and more resources. Transgender became a word I understood. I knew it was me about a year ago, April of uh, 2015. My wife was the first person I told. We told the kids. It took a month before I talked to HR at work, and another month before they got back to me, and then nothing. There really wasn't anything to do at work. I wanted my appearance to be as professional as possible. I let my hair grow, I upgraded my wardrobe. The LGBTQ Pride was in August of that year. I wanted to participate, but Pride was a public event. I checked with HR again. I wanted to make sure that the person that owned the company knew. I, I didn't want him finding out secondhand. Again, I was reassured that the company would work with me and everything would be fine. At this point, everyone above me at work knew, and a few close friends. I planned a January of 2016 coming out, nine months after I figured it out for myself. That's how long the process has taken, and it's still not done. There's a myth that the schools will let boys in the showers and girls in the showers with the boys, and they'll be using each other's bathroom, and it'll be total chaos. That's not the way it works. These kids are going to have to work through this. They need someone to trust. It may not be their parents. The teachers, principals, and counselors know these students. They know where they belong. It's a process. It takes time. These students need our support. It may be the only support they get. Thank you. Thank you for being here. James Tuppo, followed by Brenda Battle Jordan. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. I feel that it is very important to have community engagement and community involvement just so you guys aren't going in blind. I would first like to thank you for drafting these guidelines. I believe that they're absolutely essential to, be, to make sure that kids in the public schools are able to live their lives as their true selves. I would also like to remind that these guidelines are not mandatory, which I think is great, because at the end of the day, you can't force people into doing what they don't want to do, and if people feel like they're being forced, then you get all kinds of resentment. So I feel like making them voluntary is excellent, especially because that will show the schools that do adopt them really do care, and they're not just doing it to keep their funding. Um, I'll keep it very short. Basically, I feel like I want to implore you guys to ignore all of the backlash and all of the rhetoric that's founded, and don't allow Michigan to be the next North Carolina. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Brenda Battle Jordan, followed by Derek Ball. Thank you for al <clears throat> allowing me this opportunity. Uh, again, uh, my name is Brenda Battle Jordan. I'm the dean of the Westwood Heights School Board. I took the Constitution and the Bill of Rights from our conservative Hillsdale College. No need to say that I'm a Republican because I think you can see that. Uh, a call to action. The plan to allow boys and girls to use whatever bathroom they want, whatever shower they want at school. Kids, I'm talking about kids now. Anywhere. Kids don't make their own decisions. These decisions are being made by adults. Kids do what they're told. 
They don't just say, I'm going to the boy's bathroom because I think I'm a boy. And then the next day, well, I think I'm a girl. I'm going to the girl's bathroom. No, the kids don't get to make those choices. That's something that's set in place by uh, the Board of Education, number one, when you're in a school district, because I'm on the school board in the Westwood High School District. We don't want more lawsuits, I can tell you that. But I can tell you this too, we don't want little bitty ones running around because some of the girls are of age that, you know, that they can say, well, I'm just going to just go to the bathroom with Johnny. No, because we don't want this going on in our school district. Adults, you can do what you want. But kids, they're under our control. And if we're going to be the adults, we need to act like it. Now, uh, I, I'm not just saying this because I'm a Republican, because this goes across the aisle. Anybody with common sense know that a girl should go to the girls' restroom and a boy should go to the boys. Now, if you have a unisex for a high uh, a college or wherever, any other place you want, you, you can do that. But children have to remain children until they are, are adults and out, out on their own, then they can do what they want. Mm -hmm. But as long as we have the control of the Board of Education, and I, I just hope you guys, I just hope you guys make the right decision on this, because whatever you do, it, it trickles down to us, because I'm the only conservative on the board. So I, I go along, with, I, I, I have to deal with a lot already. So uh, I just hope you get this right. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Derek, excuse me, Derek Ball is next, followed by William Coons. Thank you very much. Do I have to use the chair? No, nope, nope. you can stand. Awesome. Can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yes. All right. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Derek Ball. I am uh, representing my family. I have in my hands $500 and Monopoly money. Going up to the highest bidder for $100. Anyone want it? Anyone want it? $500 for $100. No one wants it. It's a shame. Well, I'd like to read the um, State Board of Education guidelines, page two, page two, second paragraph, last sentence, and it reads as follows. Students should be treated equally, fairly, and be protected from discrimination based on their real or perceived Sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. There's three words in that that truly stand out, and that is real or perceived, because reality matters. These guidelines, if they were written by you, and you were, if you were giving them to any teacher in the state of Michigan, they would give you an F, because they are so one-sided. They are, this is not research. This is a slant. This is a push and a uh, cram down our throats. Everything from Gleason, Southern Poverty Law Center, Lambda, and some, I don't know, says on here, unpublished data. I love that one. Finally, give me the results on that one. I'd, I'd love to have that. Nothing from Liberty Council, Family Research Council, fa focus on the family or any other national center, uh, national center for fathering, did you even consider any of the data on family and fathers, especially fathers? Do you know that fathers do exactly what you want to do? The more fathers you have in the home, decrease. L listen to these. Fathers increase graduation, increase self-control, respect for others, Fathers decrease teen suicide, depression, obesity, uh, crime and recidivism rates, and psychological disorders like gender identity confusion. You've, you're, these, I, these guidelines are destroying parental rights, privacy rights, and religious rights. Reality matters. Here's the reality. Every one of us in this room and all of our kids hurt. That is reality. There's hurt all around us. I am not going to mitigate anyone's hurt that they have in their life or any, anything that they've done. But here's the thing. 
Hurt people hurt other people. These guidelines were written by Gleason, Lambda, Southern Poverty Law Center. They are hurt people and they will hurt other people and they will hurt the people they are supposed to help. They are not hurt. Or they will not help, they will hurt. I, real, three words, real or perceived. Everything hinges on that. I choose real. My money's still there. Anyone want it? <laughs> you don't believe it's real. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you. William Coons, followed by Catherine Fitzner. Hello. Hello. I'd just like to explain, explain my lens. I have a transgender son. And my transgender son was abused as a child, mostly by adults. So when you say, the adults need to do this, the parents do, well, the parents were abusing them. Not when I was there, when I wasn't there. The kids teased my kid about sexuality, which I thought was painful. But the adults would chase my kid out of a bathroom. So my kid learned not to drink all day long. Suffered high dehydration, headaches. What kind of a learning environment is that? So whatever you do to protect these kids, you're doing God's work. It clearly says in the Bible, judge not lest ye be judged. How are we judging these kids? I know a lot of the transgender kids. They wouldn't hurt a fly. They're loving kids. All they ask for is love. And that's what the Bible basically says, love. It doesn't say Jesus said, he who is free from sin, cast the first stone. Unless he's gay, then go ahead and stone him. No, it doesn't say that. I'm certain it doesn't. I'm positive. What we need to do is we need to love these kids. We need to educate these kids. Inclusion, not divisiveness. I respect every minute of your time. I know it's an extremely difficult task ahead of you. Maybe this bill isn't perfect. Come up with something. Stopping the bullies has to be the paramount consideration of any education. Have you ever been bullied? Just think for one second, if you're bullied, what goes through your mind? How do I get even? How do I get back at this person? You don't want that. Most of the kids are inclusive. When my son was before the transition, went to Andover High School and was nominated for homecoming princess. <laughs> It was crazy. Going up against a little cheerleader, blue and white little ribbons in the hair. My kid's wearing khakis, a blue shirt, and a sweater. And as we walked out there, this woman looked at me and just thought, you don't have a chance against my cheerleader. I knew she had bullied my kid. And there's nothing I wanted more than for the kids to stand up and do what was right. And as we walked down there, I thought, well, I hope this isn't humiliating for my kid. And when they announced that my kid had won the homecoming princess, she gave the crowd one of these. <laughs> and the crowd went nuts. And they stood and cheered. And I thought, that's love. And I wanted to tell that lady, you know you're a bully. And you'll never win. Because you don't love. You don't love with your heart. So think deeply about what you have to do. But thank you for your time. I could talk for 30 more minutes, but I got two seconds. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you, thank thank you. you for being here. Thank you. Catherine Fitzner, followed by Susan Russick. Good afternoon. Thank you for listening to my comments. Six years ago, when my son Spencer, then 14, came out to my husband and I as transgender, my reaction was fear. I feared for his safety. At the time, we knew little about the transgender community, and though we loved Spencer very much and would support him in every way possible, we knew that many challenges lay ahead for him. Soon after coming out to us, Spencer started living at home as a boy, and he slowly began the process of informing others, beginning with his extended family, good friends, church, and then finally his school. What's well known within the transgender community as the bathroom issue is what forced Spencer to come out at school. 
he used to beg me to pick him up immediately when school was out, even though his dad worked next door and got off only 15 minutes later. It took me a while before I understood why. Whenever I'd pick him up, Spencer always had to go to the bathroom really bad. It turns out that he had been holding it all day long, every day. Though still perceived as a, a girl at school, now that Spencer had begun his social transitioning at home, he no longer felt comfortable using the girl's bathroom, and he certainly couldn't use the boy's bathroom. So he would hold it all day long. Can you imagine? I'd been in situations where I really had to go, but there were no bathrooms available. I can recall how uncomfortable, even painful, that feeling can be. And yet for Spencer, while there were plenty of bathrooms available, there were none that he felt he could use. And I can't imagine trying to learn under those conditions. I've read many of the online comments regarding this draft document. And as the parent of a trans child, it's always difficult to read comments about issues related to the transgender community. They are oftentimes filled with hatred and vitriol and based on a lack of understanding about the LGBTQ community. As the mother of a trans son, they can be terribly hurtful. Sometimes I think we are making such great strides in the understanding, acceptance, and support of the LGBTQ community. And then I read something so alarming that the fear I felt for my son's safety the day he came out returns and overwhelms me. Some people say that these children are making a choice, seeking attention, or being rebellious. But nobody would choose to endure the hardship, pain, and isolation that many in the LGBT community face. It's not a whim. It's not a fad or a fashion. These children own their gender as deeply as, your, as you own yours. As much as you might find it offensive if forced to use the bathroom of the opposite gender, so do they. To the concerned parents of non-transgender or cisgender children, please understand that those in the transgender and gender non-conforming community are not perverts and pedophiles. They are not boys in girls' clothing. They are girls, regardless of what's below their waist. They are not waiting in the bathroom to check your ch children out. They are eager to do their business in private and leave. I applaud the Michigan Board of Education for presenting this draft document. Please stand firm in your commitment to provide a safe learning environment for all students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to remind everybody that we do have the three minute uh, limit. I know we still have over 120 or 30 people to speak and we want to be respectful. So thank you. Susan Russick, followed by Zoe Russick Steinfield. So Susan is my wife, and she had to leave for work. May I read yep. her comments? Thank you. May I have your name, please? Uh, Charles Steinfield. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. I'm here to support the guidelines that the board has created. Um, we have a trans daughter. Uh, when she came out to us, uh, it was uh, something that caused... Uh, us a lot of concern, but uh, the first thing that we did was to educate ourselves about this condition. And we educated ourselves uh, by, by connecting with medical professionals and the research community, and we feel that we, we know something about this issue. Um, what I would like to, um, I just want to comment that I think many of the people who are uh, vehemently opposed to the guidelines are uh, obtaining their information from at best uninformed media sources and at worst from sources that have a specific agenda and aren't really uh, providing information based on uh, actual medical and research information. It's, it's really propaganda. I want to say that really otherwise like uh, fair-minded and honest people who are swept up by the bathroom scare tactics really need to stop and think. People who are lurking in bathrooms to assault others yesterday, today, and tomorrow should be punished and we all know that. And mixing up the need for public facilities with a desire to commit crimes is really not a
fair-minded, uh, honest thing to do. For many people, particularly the ones propagating this idea, it begs the question, what is it that you, are, that you really don't want to see? Is, do you really want to prevent trans people from uh, leaving home, seeking jobs, enjoying decent housing, shopping in stores that we frequent, sitting next to us in restaurants or movie theaters and supporting their families? Uh, most of us know that the bathroom scare tactics really aren't about saving children. If it was, then based on sheer statistics, there would be many other segments of the population we would be prohibiting from using restrooms than, than trans people. It's really discrimination. Um, many parents have threatened to remove their children from public schools if these recommendations are honored by Michigan Public Schools, and that's certainly their right. But it's not their right to expect that a public school can discriminate against a child that they don't understand or that uh, people don't particularly care for. It's not their right to decide who gets to use public facilities that we all pay for in a public school building. And it's not their right to quote religious groups disguising themselves as pediatricians and scientists to try to push an agenda of hate and fear. Uh, when my family decided that we needed to learn about transgender issues, we listened to our daughter and many other outside sources respected in medical fields. We listened to medical institutions, to Michigan's major universities. Um, depth of knowledge on this subject is clearly missing from many of the statements that we've heard here opposing this, uh, this, these guidelines. So I, I support your efforts and thank you very much for the right to speak. Thank you for thank being you. here. Zoe Russick Steinfield followed by Aiden Ramirez Tatum. Members of the board, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Zoe Steinfield and I am a transgender woman. I'm also a graduate student at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. I would like to thank the board for upholding the rights of LGBTQ students and especially for providing well-considered and specific guidelines for how schools can treat transgender students fairly. The beauty of these guidelines is that each one of them is the end result of using common sense, providing you begin with one very simple proposition, that LGBTQ people are human beings and we deserve to be treated as such. Unfortunately, so many of the voices we've been hearing in this state and across the country and right here are attempting to deny the basic fact of our humanity. Many who have challenged these guidelines have done so under the pretext of seeking a fair and balanced compromise. They claim that the guidance attempts to provide safety and equality for transgender students at the expense of the safety and equality of their non-transgender daughters. The implication, of course, is that the very presence of transgender girls and women using the same public facilities is a threat. The accusation in this is that I am a threat. I can't begin to explain how hurt and angry I feel when I hear this lie repeated. I am not dangerous. I am a person who, like most people, needs to use the bathroom sometimes. I am a woman who, like most women, refuses to be forced out of public life or miscategorized as a man or separated away from my peers like a second-class citizen. I am a transgender woman who is intensely aware of the statistical fact that women like me are at far greater risk of being harassed in the bathroom or of violence at the hands of men. I know that much of the opposition to these guidelines comes from a place of fear, fear of what is different and confusing to some people. I would ask these people to try and imagine a different kind of fear the fear that I feel every day as a transgender woman and a student. When I use a restroom, I don't know if the person next to me would hate me if they knew I was different. I'm terrified that someone will speak to me because that would mean I might have to reply and risk being scrutinized. I try to go unnoticed because I don't know if I will be questioned, yelled at, or beaten for the audacity of thinking I have the right to relieve myself. This is the result of my living in a culture that vilifies me for my difference. Yet in the midst of this year of fear-mongering bathroom bills and continued violence against transgender bodies, I am proud to be able to say that my State Board of Education stood up to this culture and firmly upheld my humanity. I feel deeply grateful for the changes you have proposed on my behalf and on behalf of all the children who will benefit from a safer and more supportive learning environment. 
Thank you. Thank you. And I, I would ask our staff to make sure that they have all the speaking forms. So we will be cutting on that off in the next few minutes. So if there's people here that still have not turned in a form, please do so to staff so that we can uh, cut it off. We do have still 100 people to speak. So we want to make sure everybody gets that opportunity. Aiden Ramirez Tatum is next, followed by Aaron Pratt. Is Aiden here? Okay, is Aaron Pratt here? How about Daniel White? Ben White. Ryan Fewens Bliss. Gary Irish. Norm Hughes. Right here, Norm Hughes is here. All right, thanks. For the first minute, the second minute, that'll be Norma Hughes. Who's <laughs> <laughs> not? Uh, I, uh, George, I, I'm sorry, I'm, and I need to tell you, George Cullis is on deck. Okay, thank you. And uh, I hope you've ordered dinner in. Sounds like you're going to be here a while. Um, the State Board of Education has a lot of problems. Uh, I, I chair a statewide education task force. We've just impaneled our fourth phase of that. The uh, uh, problems we see, a uh, third phase, did a uh, return on investment study of education. And we saw the interesting thing that in the last uh, four years of the Granholm administration, as student population dropped, the budget did too. And under the new Republican administration, student population continued to drop 6, 8, 10, 12,000 students a year, while the budget went up $250 million a year 250 the next year, 250 the next year. Well, the quality flatlined. Public education has been a sacred cow. We throw more money at it, we throw more money at it, we throw more money at it, and we don't get good results. If I were a manufacturer of auto parts and had 3% scrap, I'd go out of business. But if a public school turns out 50% scrap, you get a raise. There's something wrong with that problem, and, and I, we hope you'll address that. We fear that this policy, if you put it through, is going to exacerbate the problem because we think it's going to de it inc uh, increase the loss of students more rapidly from the public schools. I think that's very clear. Michigan is 40th in quality in the United States. That's 34th in quality in the world, despite the fact that we are the most expensive school system in the world, not Michigan specifically, but the United States. A fifth grader in Wiesbaden gets 50% more instructional hours than a fifth grader in Michigan. We're not keeping up. We may graduate 60,000 engineers in the United States this year, where they graduate 400,000 in India and 600,000 in China. I think public education is the greatest national security threat, and it's in your hands. But I, I, I think also, uh, with respect to this particular uh, guidance that you want to offer, uh, Ann Rand said you've got, you can do anything you want to do as long as you don't initiate a force against somebody else. You want to do porn, just don't put it out for my kids and grandkids to see. You want to do something different in the bathroom or in your, bed, in your bedroom, that's up to you. Your right to swing your fist ends at the beginning of my nose. And you're seeing maybe one third of one percent that might fit into this category that you want to push this guidance on, and this guidance will have the weight of law in many cases. And I don't think you're considering the rights of the other 99%. And I think you really have to consider that or you're going to continue to lose students at a greater rate. And that's, I don't think, is good for public schools. So think in terms of what kind of a bang for a buck you're given to a student in your, in your schools. It's not good. Most of the great countries are getting their teachers from the top third of the class. On a whole, we get ours from the bottom third of the class. There's something endemically wrong with the process. So we hope as our task force goes forth, forward and studies um, the, the uh, impediments of good education that the education establishment imposes, including the State Board of Education, that we'll be, have a chance to come back and uh, share our results with you and, uh, and, and work on that problem next. Thank you and God bless. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. George Coolis is next, followed by Danae Nelson. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. 
I come to you today as a grandfather and a former councilman. So on both levels, I know what it is to make difficult decisions, both dealing with the grandchildren and dealing with the public. Uh, I also serve in my community. Uh, I am the director of the Dickens Festival. I'm from the village of Holly. I also am involved in the theater program in the schools. And I've been part of Holly Area Youth Coalition, dealing with the kids there on youth dialogue days uh, where the youth have an opportunity to come and talk to the adults and tell them some of the issues that are at the school. So I've had an opportunity to deal with a lot of these kids and I've heard their opinions on this. I found it interesting today as I sit here and I listen to some of the people coming, if you oppose my opinion it's because you're uneducated and you're afraid. I don't think that's where I come from as I sit here. I consider myself to be both educated and when it comes to the kids pretty fearless. The fact of the matter is, those are the people we're here to protect. We have a room full of adults that are making decisions on our children's, much so, much like parents do. Um, today, I found myself coming to this hearing out of the cry of one of those students I'm involved with. She will be following me next at this podium. This young lady I've been involved with since she was 12. I've been involved with her through the theater program, through the Dickens Festival, through her school. She is a survivor of a suicide attempt. We're all blessed to have her with us to this day. And she wanted an opportunity to have her, her voice heard. And I saw to it that that opportunity was here. So thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Danae Nelson, followed by Tim Larrabee. Hi, everyone. I'm Danae. Um, I just want to start out by thanking you for letting me be here and speaking about this. Now, as Mr. Cole said, I'm a student at Holly High School. I am a sophomore this year. Now, I have friends who are part of the community. Um, Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. I have been diagnosed with anxiety disorder. Um, I want you all to picture yourself back in high school. Now, I have a lot of guy friends. I know what they talk about. Oh, I just heard this from so-and-so. Oh, I hear so-and-so has a magazine. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong for transgender people to want to use the bathroom they identify with, but having a male mind at maybe age 13 to 18, you're still developing and you're still trying to understand. But boys are curious and I would be scared to use the bathroom with some of the guys in my school. Now, I know for a fact they are straight. I know for a fact they would use this to their advantage to see girls. Seeing that is, it's scary for me. I would be the one holding it until I got home or asking my mother to let me go home so I could use that. It's, can't think of the right word. It's just, I don't want to say it's not right, but there is something about it that, yes, it is threatening. I could have a male teacher walk in. Maybe that male teacher isn't always professional. I could have in a public restroom, an older man come in and try and see me. I don't want that. My mother would be absolutely appalled at it. She'd be absolutely livid. But I am definitely opposed to this. Maybe we should find another way, have a single stall unisex bathroom or something that they feel safe in as well as we feel safe. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Tim Larrabee followed by Darlene Petty.
Good afternoon. My name is Tim Larrabee. I'm an Associate Professor of Education at Oakland University. I'm in the Department of Teacher Development and Educational Studies, and my uh, job is to train uh, folks who are working on the elementary teaching certificate. Um, one of the things that I know is that my students are passionate about creating a safe space for all of their future students. They, they know LGBT folks are going to be in their schools. They know they're going to have kids from LGBT identified parents. And they know this is, these are people that they have to work with in, the, in their future careers and create a safe environment where those students can learn, where their parents are respected, and where they are felt welcome. So that, so that the community all works together, the school, the kids, and the parents all, all work in unison. So what doesn't happen is my students don't learn anything about the LGBT community in their teaching certification program. At Oakland University, they have one class on, on diversity and classroom management, and we know that classroom management is the number one issue that new teachers drop out of school, and so they get half a class on that and half a class on working with their, the diverse communities that are going to be in their classrooms. So they, so, while they are passionate about providing safe places for all their students to learn, they have yet to, they don't have an opportunity to learn about different communities in the way that they need to, to work intelligently, cooperatively, compassionately with the, with the great variety of students and parents that are going to be part of their work. Um, if we, if the, what, what these guidelines begin to do is provide these future teachers with ideas about how they can how they can show respect for all of their students, not just and and this seems to be centering on transgender students, but gay and lesbian and bisexual and intersex students as well, all need to be respected and acknowledged. Um, so uh, the the um, uh, so and. You know, and, and the idea about adopting these, these guidelines, clearly there is no set of guidelines that we could draw up that would make everybody happy. We have conflicting views, we have conflicting worldviews. And so um, there is, so, so the emphasis needs not to be on the adults, but on the students and on the kids. So how do we create safe places for them? One of the things we know is this is also a generational issue, that those folks who are older, the adults that are making all these decisions struggle much more with LGBT issues than the next generation of folks. And so the students that are coming up, that's a quick three minutes. Um, the, the students that are coming up are going to grow up knowing that LGBT folks are a part, an integral part of their community that deserve respect and acknowledgement. And so we just need to be moving that, that way. And out of time. Thank you so much. Thank for you for being here. Darlene Petty is next, followed by Anita Calcano. Sorry, I know I did that wrong. If I could for one minute, as I was leaving the room, I was informed that whoever's taking down the notes for this meeting had put me down as someone who supports this law. No, we don't, we don't have that. Okay, well, they, several people came to me as I left outside, and I wanted to make sure that I was not down on that side. No, right. we understood. All right, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Darlene Petty, and I just want to uh, speak from my heart. I'm a mom of four. I'm a grandma of 11, and six of them are middle school ages, and you know how, how hard that is to be a middle school age uh, student. And I also want to say I am very grateful that we live in a country where we can speak freely. That's a blessing. So I have three points. Number one is the health concern that I have. Um, I am strongly opposed to combining gender bathrooms. Um, the health issue I have is in conversations with my middle school age grandchildren. Um, they are just plain embarrassed. They're like, Cammie, we would just be embarrassed. And they're sincere in that. And uh, so if someone was to come in and to, to the bathroom and expose their, I will say, physical plumbing opposite their own, 
these kids would be just plain embarrassed. And I've heard others say the health issue that would be involved with that would be that the kids would hold it till they get home. And of course, they're gonna end up with a UTI. Those things are painful, and this is a reality. Um, it doesn't need to be. So that's my number one issue. Uh, number two is uh, the safety. Uh, my concern would be uh, allowing kids to use the bathroom of their choice. Let's face it, we're all human. Kids are gonna talk, adults talk, but kids are gonna pick on each other. Doesn't matter if we're all straight or if we're not. Kids are gonna pick. There will be verbal abuse. I'm sure there already is verbal abuse, but it will be increased, I'm afraid. Um, clear up to, you know, to assault and battery. We don't need that. Clear up to criminal sexual conduct. And we certainly don't need to be asking for any more problems than we already have. Kids will be kids, but requiring boys to stay in the boys' bathroom, girls to stay in the girls' bathroom, will increase their safety immensely. That's my feeling. And the third point I have is at the end of the day, the only thing that really will matter is if God can be pleased with our lives and smile on us. God will smile on us if we provide sufficient number of clean, comfortable, unisex bathrooms conveniently located around a school. They don't need to go searching for them. They can be out in public. I didn't mean to say out in public. Out easy, easily accessible. Sufficient, clean, comfortable, unisex bathrooms conveniently located around a school so we can keep our kids healthy, safe, and confident. And finally, I want to add, I don't hate anyone. I simply hate the fact that common sense will be thrown out, I feel, if this policy would be passed. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Anita Calcano, followed by Karen Walker. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak today. Um, I represent the Greater Lansing Area PFLAG Group. Um, we fully support the board's guidelines because we support the LGBTQ community and that includes all our children. Um, we applaud your attempt to bring our schools into compliance with Title IX by providing a far-reaching plan to reduce risk factors by reaching out to all those who impact our students' lives, not just the teachers and administrators, but school support staff and students and parents and families, I, I could see from the guidelines that you clearly address the parental issue, which everyone seems to think you haven't. Um, at PFLAG, we have firsthand knowledge of the vulnerable students who sometimes wait to go home rather than face the bathroom issue. The students whose parents have to resort to homeschooling to protect their children from constant bullying and harassment, and the students who can't be themselves even at home and wind up couch surfing at the homes of friends. And these are some of the most tragic cases when you can't even be out to your parents. The philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer said that all truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Then it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. We hope that you, the members of the board, will stand up and defend our children, all our children, from the ignorant, the misguided, and the politically opportunistic, who would keep our children from having a safe space in which to learn. Uh, we find the board's guidelines contain self-evident truth. Please help us all move to the third stage. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Karen Walker is next, follow followed by Jennifer Tafel. Hi, my name is Karen Walker, and I support the Board of Education. Um, I want all children to feel safe in school, and I am married to a transgender woman. And I don't know. thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Tafel is next, followed by. Shamlin Walker. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I speak on behalf of many queer Christians. 
I'm also a member of the East Lansing Clergy Association, but not an official spokesperson. For too long, faith has been used as a weapon, specifically the Christian and privileged tradition. It's been used to promote fear, bigotry, power, and personal agendas for centuries. The issue at hand, providing safe, secure, and thriving educational environments, specifically for the LGBT, LGBTQ population, but ultimately for all students, is yet another opportunity to misuse faith as a weapon, and it's time for that to change. I read through the document that the board is proposing, as well as some of the comments online. What became clear after reading through the comments was that faith was the basis for some of the anger and fear, unfortunately. As I prepared my statement for today, two passages from scripture came to mind. First from Galatians, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. The second comes from the 25th chapter in the Gospel of Matthew, when the ruler says, truly I tell you, just as you did to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. The underlying message is one of wholeness and true community. My hope is that these guidelines pass. They are sound and solid ideas aimed at providing safety and hope where currently there is little. What I gleaned from the commentary online surrounding this is also the need for education and engagement of parents, guardians, and extended family members of our state's students. I hope that will be part of the parental engagement and support program listed in the document. It's clear that hearts and minds need to continue to open. As queer identified and affirming member of the clergy, it is my call to remind us of the redemptive and inclusive power of the Christian faith, which has done so much harm, and to be a light where there is darkness. My walk in ministry is with those who identify as queer and Christian, and who more than anything are seeking wholeness, safety, and a place in the world. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Shamlin Walker is next, followed by Glenn M. Ray, Jr. Hello, I'm Charlene Walker I'm from Portland, Michigan. A little background, I'm a Vietnam-era veteran. I was a foster parent in Berry County for quite a few years. I'm now retired from that. And I've lived through this. I'm a transgender woman, and I've been this way since grade school. And it's hell being on the backside, not being able to go to the bathroom, not being able to accept just, I mean, that's, it's just extremely difficult as a child doing, going through this. I mean, they need all the support that they can possibly get from anyone that can get it from. As far as being a foster parent, I've seen parents that I would not allow into a jail cell, let alone be parents. So we cannot always rely on the parents to do what's right. I wish they all would. It would be nice if they did, but they don't. So in closing, I support this. I really hope it goes through. And thank you much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Glenn M. Ray Jr. and Tim Barnes. Glenn Jr. Glenn, Glenn Ray Jr. Tim Barnes. Christine Barnes. Steve Houston. Brian Flynn. Aaron Busby. Gloria Houston. David Coleman. Daniel Wallace, Danielle, not Daniel. Is this Danielle? Yes. Okay.
Hello, I am Danielle Wallace, and I'm here to represent um, myself and 13 other pediatricians around the state of Michigan. We have deep concerns about the adverse effects to the well-being of children that result from the policies proposed by the board. We also recognize the great importance that all students be treated equally, fairly, and without discrimination. However, we do not believe the proposed policy changes promote these goals for Michigan students, including those who are LGBTQT identified. To eliminate sex segregated private spaces in public schools violates all students' fundamental rights to privacy and safety. In view of adolescent development, it is inevitable that some male students will feign non-congruence with their biological sex in order to gain access to the opposite sex bathrooms <coughs> and locker rooms. Consequently, consequently, the proposed policy changes will likely increase the incidence of disturbing or harassing conduct, including but not limited to indecent exposure, voyeurism, and evil, even um, rape. We anticipate that these proposed policies will cause anxiety for the vast majority of female students and potentially trigger symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder um, for the, those that are survivors of sexual abuse or sexual assault. All of these problems would be avoided if single occupancy unisex bathrooms were available for all students to use should they be uncomfortable with the arrangement of the multi-stalled sex segregated bathrooms. Additionally, regarding students who do not feel congruent with their biological sex, science shows that if these students are not labeled by others and are permitted to develop their feelings without undue influence by others, the vast majority spontaneously outgrow these feelings. The DSM-5 shows that as many as 97.8 of gender-confused boys and 88% of gender-confused girls eventually accept their biological sex after naturally passing through puberty. Therefore, we do not feel that, parent, um, that schools should promote or lock a student into a lifestyle or identity that perhaps may just be a phase that they are passing through. Um, we would also like for you to keep in mind that same-sex attraction is very fluid during adolescence, so it is not appropriate for professionals working with students to promote labeling and permanence of sexual identity Approximately one-fourth of young teens report experiencing same-sex attraction, but most do not go on to claim a homosexual identity, as only approximately 2.7% of American adults identify as gay, lesbian, or bisexual, per the CDC. Professionals working in school should be educated regarding this extreme fluidity and should not encourage students to make potentially life-altering decisions as they navigate their feelings on sexual issues. We support that all students in Michigan public schools have the right to feel safe and to have their right of privacy and modesty protected. Title IX requires that the school provide a safe environment for all students, not just for those identifying as another gender, creating an environment that makes most students feel unsafe, violated, or even traumatized in order to make a few feel more comfortable is not an acceptable solution. Thank you for your time. I would like to share um, this letter with you all. Thank you for being here. Rahelio Landine is our next speaker, followed by Kenneth Frank. Go ahead. President Austin, board members, Superintendent Whiston, thank you for the opportunity to come before you. The White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for Hispanics President's Advisory Commission invited commission staff from other White House advisories to their meeting two weeks ago to jointly discuss equity. Advanced Ed recently released their report incorporating pervasive accountability. Every component of our solution includes analytics to support the need for real-time data for all stakeholders. Last week, the Consortium on School Networking released its digital equity report, which now includes digital use equity, recommending hotspot technology. This validates the digital use portion of our solution presented to this board 15 months ago. 75% of school districts do not have a strategy for off-campus connectivity. 88% of respondents stated affordability is the biggest barrier for families lacking internet access at home. 
56% of teachers agreed that the lack of resources or access to digital technologies among <coughs> students is a challenge in their classrooms. 97% of teachers agreed that students don't have the digital tools they need to effectively complete assignments while at home. The legislature passed a $16 billion state ed budget. By leveraging federal title funds, our solution is capable of contributing $3.4 billion or 21% to the budget. Yesterday, Grad Nation released their report reaffirming the challenges of poverty with 65% of students in schools with adjusted cohort graduation rates below 67%. Michigan is one of 10 states that graduates less than 70% in all five subgroups, disabled, Hispanic, African American, low income, and English language learners. Michigan's 43% low income students are subject to the fourth highest graduation rate gap of nearly 23%. Though alternative charter and virtual schools collectively account for 14% of high schools and 8% of high school students, they make up 52% of low graduation rate high schools nationwide and produce 20% of non-graduates. Regular high schools account for 41% of low grad rate high schools and are where the majority of students who do not graduate on time can be found. What that says to me is that these schools are also in need of more resources and supports. My appeal to this board and this department is to encourage you to seize the opportunity to lead the nation on the issue of equity by providing a policy framework that encourages and permits districts to incorporate solutions as part of an overall comprehensive strategy for our most vulnerable students. In closing, I would like to invite the Michigan Department of Education to participate in the Detroit International Human Trafficking Summit June 9th at Cobo Center Information can be found on lfnow.org. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Kenneth Frank is next, followed by Frank Rice. <clears throat> Hello, uh, I'm a professor at Michigan State, and I'm the father of Reed Elfson Frank, who is transgender, uh, female to male. Um, I want to give you a look of what Reed's life has been like sort of post-transition although that's always a process. He's more engaging, uh, he's more social, uh, he's a better person in terms of the way he engages as a family member, uh, his sister, uh, and other people around him. Um, a lot of that is because he can interact as he is and not have to pretend to be someone he's not. Um, he's doing well at an early college program, uh, which is a program that embraces and supports diversity. And that has a lot to do with how Reed is currently doing. Uh, and I note that Reed went to public high school in Michigan, um, and it was a more difficult atmosphere. Even though the uh, faculty and administrators were supportive and trying to be thoughtful, it was a more challenging atmosphere. And so these attributes of Reed did not present themselves in the way they do now. With a more uh, supportive and uh, uh, embracing atmosphere, I think he could have flourished even earlier as many of his friends and colleagues could do. When he comes home, uh, which will be soon, pick him up next week, uh, we hope that he'll have equal access to social institutions in the state, led in, at first by the, the schools. Um, I want to emphasize that Reed is not a person to be feared, ridiculed, or pitied. He's not a piece of a slippery slope. He's a young man. Um, and he just wants to engage a community, contribute to a community, and he will do so to any community that opens and embraces him. Uh, that contribution would be lost if he is not embraced and able to engage. So I recognize you all have a tough job. I hope you can find some thoughtful, middle ground, valuable ground. Uh, and I do think it's valuable for you all to come up with guidelines that schools can, can think and implement Part of what I study is how to make schools work well. And it's hard if every school has to come up with its own policy, do its own research, uh, with, uh, uh, and, and learn from a relatively small number of people as they go along the way. Better if somebody steps back and integrates across schools and thinks about it and comes up with guidelines and policies. So I applaud you for doing so, and I support the guidelines that you've recommended. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Frank Rice, followed by Bria Brown. Mm -hmm. Is Frank Rice here? Is Bria Brown here? 
Alan Wackendorfer, Nicole Ellison. Did I just say your name? Alan. Yep. Yep. Alan Wackendorfer. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thanks for taking all the time to hear from everybody. It's great. Uh, my name is Alan Wackendorfer. I'm the Director of Public Policy for the National Association of Social Workers in Michigan. Uh, we represent over 6,000 social workers in, um, in Michigan, 150,000 nationwide. Um, we're the voice of the profession and the code of ethics, the social work code of ethics, excuse me. Self-determination is one of our core values and that's really kind of what we're talking about here. I'm here today to express the support of the empirically based best practice guidelines that this board has created, not mandates. I think it's important to point out that these aren't mandates. Um, not only did you do the job you were asked to do, uh, but you did it well, which seems to be increasingly rare these days in government, unfortunately. Uh, you deserve recognition for at least that. But I also wanted to speak on a personal level as a parent of a school-aged child. Um, it's important to me that my child learn in a safe, inclusive environment, free from bullying and harassment. And I believe that these guidelines will provide schools who are willing some of the tools necessary to work towards creating such an environment. So this isn't about religion, ideology, politics, or bathrooms. This isn't about me or your uncomfortableness. This is about protecting our youth, about protecting some of our most vulnerable youth. This is about prevention, prevention of bullying, depression, anxiety, suicide, things that social workers and other mental health professionals see clients deal with on a daily basis. And it's not just about tolerance either, because to tolerance is merely just putting up with someone. It's about affirmation, acceptance, and support, empowerment, things like that. So in the words of Attorney General Loretta Lynch, just spoken yesterday, in support of our friends and family who are transgender. We see you, we stand with you, and we will do everything we can to protect you going forward. History is on your side. And I think that this board has an opportunity to be on the right side of that history as well. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Is Nicole Ellison here? Okay. She'll be followed by Cherie Thomas. Good afternoon. Thank you to the board for um, making the time to hear all of us. Uh, my name is Nicole Ellison. I live in Williamston, Michigan. I'm the parent of a transgender son who's 17. My husband spoke a few, spoke a few moments ago. I don't want to talk about my son particularly. What I want to talk about today is um, the truly impressive amount of fear that I have heard discussed um, by people saying that they are afraid that if this, which we have to say, voluntary guidance. I've heard a lot of talk in the hallway about people saying this has the force of law. This is a suggestion, right? The suggestion that transgender children be allowed to use the restroom that conforms with their gender identity. So much fear, as if this was going to be the end of life as we know it. I want to ask those people, not to come and speak to me directly, although I would welcome you to do so if you would like, but I would like you to stop a second and think about where is that fear coming from? Have you ever met a transgender person? Have you ever talked with a transgender person? When they want to go to the bathroom, guess what they want to do? They just want to use the toilet. That's all they want to do. They don't want to go in there and molest our little girls or molest our little boys. Like you and me, it's the same biological need. There are people who do want to molest our little boys and girls. That's an entirely different conversation than what we're talking about here today. What we're talking about is how to make our LGBTQ youth safe in our schools. And if you keep bringing up the boogeyman in the bathroom, that's not what we're talking about. So I applaud the board for taking this up to help the districts in the state who have asked you for guidance that you responded to. 
to help districts in our state comply with federal law so we don't end up being an embarrassment, frankly, like the state of North Carolina. I want to thank the board for hearing everybody, because everybody's voice deserves to be heard. If you agree with me or not, you have a right to be heard. However, our disagreements are not ultimately what are going to decide the merit of what happens with this policy. That has to do with legal standing. That has to do with justice. And it does not have to do with fear mongering. And it does not have to do with the person's religion. We don't live in Afghanistan. We live in America. We have the right, each of us, I'm a Jew. Some of you may be Christians, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, or atheists. We all have the right to our own beliefs, but no one group has the right to say because their God or their Bible or their pastor puts it out that my child should be denied equal access at school. So I implore you to be forward thinking and, and compassionate in your understanding of the issues. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Cherie Thomas is next. Followed by Jim Skur. Good afternoon. My name is Cherie Thomas, and I work for the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to share my comments with you on the State Board of Education Statement and Guidance on Safe and Supportive Learning Environments for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Questioning Students. Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence mission is to develop and promote efforts aimed at the elimination of all domestic and sexual violence in Michigan. Our vision includes a commitment to building a legacy of equality, peace, and social justice where domestic and sexual violence no longer exists. Intimate partner violence and sexual assault are realities in our state of Michigan. Far too many youth are witnessing and having firsthand experiences with violence. This violence includes behaviors such as bullying, teasing, harassment, sexual assault, physical assault, and suicide related behaviors. This exposure to <coughs> violence can have negative effects on their education. LGBTQ youth are at an increased risk for suicidal thoughts and behaviors, suicide attempts, and suicide. In order to create a space that is safe for all youth, who attend Michigan schools, inclusive practices, policies, and procedures are necessary. Privacy and confidentiality are paramount for LGBTQ youth. In homes where domestic and sexual violence are present, the ability to share your gender identity may not be a viable option. Students have the right to decide when, how, and with whom they share their information. Allowing a student to use the restroom that corresponds with their gender identity is an important step in creating a safe and supportive learning environment. Giving students options that are non-stigmatizing and available upon request sends a message of acceptance. There is an unfounded fear that allowing youth to use a restroom that corresponds to their gender identity will create vulnerability to sexual assault for women and girls. Sexual assault and assaults against LGBTQ youth are occurring in restrooms due to the lack of acceptance of a person's right to self-identity. Transgender individuals are often subject to violence because of being transgender by strangers and intimate partners. <coughs> Sexual assault is sometimes used as a hate crime against LGBT youth. Their perpetrators of most sexual assaults are men who identify as straight. There is no evidence that schools choosing to accept or use these recommendations would increase sexual violence or risk for non-LGBTQ youth. In closing, equality and peace and social justice are our mission, and the work that we are doing here today is instrumental to that. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Jim Skur, followed by Scott Mallory. This group is made up of a number of minorities, and I'm going to guess the smallest one is the one that's made up of people that are undecided. <laughs> Any undecided people here? Talk about a meeting where nobody's going to change their mind. But anyways, that's not what we're here for. That's not what I came here for. But one thing I found is I kept finding the most profound things being said by people that I disagreed with. Hmm. It's interesting. I do that a lot, though. Um, another thing I've learned in life is the issue is usually not the issue. The issue here is not bathrooms. 
It's really not. That's what you could maybe call a symptom or the little topic that we're going to be talking about. Are we going to be? We've been talking about. The things that I heard that were said by people I disagreed with is there are people that are looking for love. They're looking for affirmation. And I disagreed with those people on what they see with your policy because I disagree with your policy. But I agree that there are people that are looking for love, affirmation, acceptance. Somebody that I was supposed to agree with basically said, if you have a penis, you get to go into the men's room. I think he left so I can say that was really stupid. <laughs> if you are allowing yourself to be defined by your body parts, you're pretty shallow. But I'd also like to say, if you're allowing yourself to be defined by how you wear your hair, if you have a purse or not, how many piercings, the tattoo you have, any one of those is shallow. And that's why I don't like this policy, because it's, it's perpetuating an environment where we're allowing people to say, that's where I'm going to find myself. And if you stand against this and say, no, that's not where you go to find yourself, you don't go to the bathroom to find yourself. You go there to take a leak. That's what you go there for. Certain people go to this one, and certain people go to that one. And it's about that simple. So I would encourage you to not pass this policy. Stand up and be leaders. Abraham Lincoln said, most men can handle adversity. If you want to see their character, see how they handle power. You've been given power. Hundreds and hundreds of schools and teachers and administrators that are going to follow your lead. And are you going to base that on something valuable and important? Or are you being manipulated which is very unpowerful into doing something that really just doesn't make a lot of sense. I could sit and talk about all my awards, and the one I would tell you about is being Father of the Year. I've been Father of the Year a whole bunch of times. <laughs> I can pull out my drawer and show you all my kids' notes. I've been, I have a, I'm a dad of five daughters, one son. Two of them we had at home, two of them we had in the hospital, two of them we didn't have. We adopted them. I've been a dad to six foster kids, and every single one of them has had an identity issue, trying to find out who they are. I'm a child of a king, and that's where I find my identity. Thank you for being here. Scott Mallory is next, followed by Jane Locke. Scott Mallory here? How about Jane Locke? Robert Wright? Oh, Jane Locke, and then Robert Wright will be next if he's here. Had to run from the other side of the room. Sorry, I'm kind of trying clipping along here. Okay, my name is Jane Locke. I'm from Holland, Michigan. Quite honestly, I didn't have any clue how I was going to address this crowd today, other than I might. One of the misconceptions about trans people is that, well, gee, you know, today I feel like a girl. I think I'll go in the girls' room. Oh, tomorrow I feel like a boy. It doesn't work like that at all. It's as much a part of your basic identity as your basic identity is. You knew the moment you could verbalize it what your gender was. And it's no different from any trans individual. They don't turn it on and turn it off at will. Now, perverted heterosexual males may try to pull those things. In fact, a presidential candidate even remarked so much. But that's not why I'm here. I want to tell you, as a Pentecostal, born-again Christian, what my experience is when I came out as transsexual. I was in a non-denominational Pentecostal-leaning church in Milford, Michigan, and part of the praise and worship team. And the very first thing my good Christian friends did was to kick me off of the praise and worship team and kick me out of the church. Also a founding member of the Living Word Riders, which is the local Hull area chapter of the Christian Motorcycle Association. And the moment that it was found out that I was transsexual, my gosh, these wonderful Christians kicked me off of the Christian Motorcycle Association as a founding member. Within two weeks, my 
the new employer, after a merger, a very accepting company decided, gosh, there's no room for trans girls like you around here anymore. You're out. And those are the indignities that we routinely suffer. And it's all because of fear and ignorance. I am no different than any, any other individual in this room. And neither are these other gender nonconforming people. We are just human beings. And all we are looking for is to have a fair shake. And there's not a single one of us who's going to sneak into your damn bathroom and expose ourselves. How many of you people have ever seen any, in, any individual expose themselves in a bathroom? It simply does not happen. It's a figment of your imagination. I want to use the bathroom just as much as you, 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 any other you people want to use the bathroom. And that's all we do. And if you think otherwise, you are deluded. And I'm righteously indignant by the way my Christian brothers and sisters use the Bible to drive people away from Jesus. Satan himself can't do a better job of driving people away from Jesus than these well-meaning Christians. And I stridently work when in my LGBT community to bring people in to know Jesus. At the same time, my Christian brothers and sisters and their righteousness drive more people away from Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, than Satan himself could ever dream of doing. And it angers me to no end. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Robert Wright followed by Nicolette Snyder. Is Robert Wright here? Yep. Oh. Make it his way. Yeah, I'm here. Um, actually, this is really fun for me that I followed Jane because we were in line together, and even though we um, disagree on the outcome, we shared a pizza together. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, that's where we want to get. You know, we want to be together and we want to figure out this problem because it is a problem. And, you know, it, I, I don't like that it's, it's perceived from a public perspective or even a, a, a surface perspective that somehow we all fit into one category or another category. I don't like that. It, it bothers me because I deal with people's problems all the time. I'm a psychologist. I have a card that says I have a Michigan license to practice psychology. And I've done that for many years. And before that, I was an educator. I've done that for many years. I have five children. All of them are doing wonderfully. One is serving the marginalized women in Africa. She's go mo moving to Kenya next year, or, I mean next month, to work with marginalized women who've been raped and, and caught up in, in, the, in the Civil War. And she's, she's retraining them and helping them. My other daughter works as an educator, a science educator in Bangladesh. She's teaching street kids who have been severely uh, um, um, uh, abused, and she's training them to, to, to move up in life. Um, and, and so it, I'm a big supporter of this outcome. What I'm not a supporter of is this policy, because I believe it's not going to accomplish the desired ends. To me, this is not about transgendered. I, I'm, it's not about that. Um, she even said, Jane said, that, um, you know, it's, it's not about going to the bathroom. It's about the unintended consequences. To me, it is. What, a couple of things that I just want to share. This, this is just interesting to me. The definition of a multi or multiple occupancy bathroom or changing facility, a facility designed or designated to be used by more than one person at a time where students may be in various states of undress. Think about that. <coughs> Students are in various stages of undress. And, and this policy, if, if taken by a local school district, will allow, and I'm not talking about the transgender, I don't, I don't even think that there will be even one person who will be abused by transgender students. I'm talking about the people who will use that, not to dress up as, as a transgender person, but just someone will go in because it's now allowed. There's no objective standard for that to happen, to go in and to, to make that, th that happen. A poser, um, someone who is going to not to, to try to get it access who hasn't up to this date. 
Another thing that I, I saw in your um, end notes of the policy it was there's a there's a uh, evidence for not evidence but a, a data from FERPA, which is the the uh, freedom of information that you exchange. It says the FERPA states that no educational institution shall be granted funding if it does not provide parents and or students a hearing process through which they can challenge the content of school records, ensure that records are not inaccurate. And then the judge says, if you are under 18, your parent or legal guardian must be the one to make the request. FERPA says that. FERPA says the parent has to make the request to change any information. So how is it that your policy says the parent should be excluded from that process? You're vi from my perspective, a, a, just a normal reading, you're violating FERPA by allowing the parents not to be informed. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Nicolette Snyder. Elko Foucault. Are you Nicolette or are you? I yep. am Nicolette, yes. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Nicolette Snyder. I am a wife and mother of three. I am a labor and delivery registered nurse and lactation consultant. I am also a part-time faculty professor in nursing. I am here today to discuss this proposal from the perspective of how it will unintentionally harm other marginalized students. The sexually assaulted is a vulnerable group also protected under Title IX with a litany of case law that assigns schools across the nation the responsibility to prevent and protect the sexually assaulted. This vulnerable group, like the trans community, invariably copes with mental health challenges like PTSD, suicide, and other chronic mental health illnesses, which makes the definition of safety in places like bathrooms and locker rooms imperative to them too. First, a few facts, and these facts are conservative. It's known that sexual assault is highly underreported, as survivors don't trust that people in power will protect them. For our population of interest here, one in five, and some statistics show one in four girls are assaulted before the age of 17 by a dating partner. 7% of all sexual assault in, chil in children happens in school. Professionally, I am familiar with how survivors need the definition of safety considered in private spaces and intimate experiences from undress to birth to breastfeeding and more. I have attended more deliveries than I care to admit where women suffer the effects of sexual assault and are unable to open their legs to deliver their baby until the inevitable moment occurs, even with appropriate pain medication on board. Survivors have a physiological need to protect themselves that greatly impacts their safety. There's, there is safety protection and comfort in the current definition of biological identity that our culture has long held for the sexually assaulted when it comes to private places and spaces where intimate experiences occur. Until you know and understand how they've learned to cope, you will not understand the importance of their protection. To function intimately, in locker rooms with the opposite biological sex is not a demand that society should place on this group of individuals. Even if this assertion is met with disagreement, our public school system will still be held to the responsibility to prevent and protect sexual assault. Again, already a court published opinion. That will be difficult, if not impossible, for schools to meet without suffering consequences when we remove healthy boundaries that already exist and serve as current protection. I know that all stakeholders have not been brought to the table in defining safety in these private places. There has been a lot of conversation around this topic and if you are wondering about the consensus, my personal insight says that it does not affirm the approach in this proposal. I also believe that those of you supporting it will not be remembered as future politicians that have made decisions in the best interest of their people, all of their people. I think you will be remembered for not having a full conversation and for not bringing all stakeholders to the table. I would appreciate it if the board stood back and looked at the unintended consequences and find a better way to honor all students in determining safety and defining safety. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Elko Foucault? Can you spell that? Yes, I'd be happy to. A-L-K-O-F? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, so I want to speak to you today as both a transgender individual and as a sexual assault survivor. Um, 
I've never felt traumatized or triggered by sharing a bathroom with a transgender individual. Uh, I have felt traumatized and triggered and embarrassed and humiliated <laughs> having to use restrooms that uh, I don't, aren't the gender that I identify with. And I felt threatened um, in those situations. So I thank you for creating these guidelines um, and for supporting LGBTQ students because it's really hard. Um, I also want to speak to you as a former um, public school student. Uh, I graduated from community high school in Ann Arbor, Michigan about five years ago. Um, and I didn't know that I was queer in any sense uh, all through high school and all through middle school. So I spent all of high school and all of middle school very anxious and very depressed. Um, I felt really isolated and I didn't know why. Um, I had a lot of social anxiety and I did very, not very poorly, but significantly worse in school than I would have otherwise because of all these issues. And I think these guidelines really do increase the visibility of LGBTQ students. And if I had known that gender nonconformity and transgender people existed in high school, then I would have done so much better um, as a high school student. <laughs> um, so I sh that's all I have to say. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Devon Burt. Followed by Jan Stowe. Hi. <coughs> How are you guys? Um, I'm Dave Bomberg. Um, I live in Detroit, Michigan. I just want to pretty much um, represent myself. Um, I'm a bisexual person. Um, I'm also um, clearly um, black <laughs> as well. <laughs> Um, but I just think these guidelines are very important um, considering like how I think back in high school um, and how I wish these guidelines were like back then and when I was in high school like in 2009 to 2011 um, identifying as bisexual and you know how um, bisexuality is um, pretty much a sexuality that's kind of like invalid and it's always erased. Um, I suffered from a lot of identity issues and trying to fight the binary standard of being gay or straight. Um, being bullied for multiple things, my hair, my lips, my nose, um, me just being fat, and also my um, queer identity. Um, I feel as if these guidelines were here, were there before when I was in high school, I think I would have flourished so much better just to see the representation, just to see that um, that my identity matters as well and that there are people out there like me, just like Aiko was saying. Um, I just think socially, emotionally, um, spiritually, I would have just flourished better as a human being instead of going through so much, um, being diagnosed with depression at the age of 12 and anxiety at the age of 14. Um, I just feel like that would not have happened. I just know that if there was a safe environment for me, if there was a teacher out there that I can reach out to, um, I just know that it would be better better for me. And that's why I'm here, just to speak about this, um, to to make sure that other students who may identify like like I, I am, to have a better opportunity in life, you know, so they can flourish as well and do really great at academics and everything. Um, it's really rough growing up um, being queer. Um, and I know, you know, it's a lot of people that may not understand, and I know it's different, like, worldviews, but um, I really support this, and I think it's great that we are ha having this conversation because it's definitely, definitely something that needs to be said. And we are here. We matter. And I went to a D Detroit public school, high school, and... We're here, and uh, queer people are here, and we deserve to have a good life like everyone else is. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Jan Stowe, followed by Nan O'Meara. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Uh, my name is Jan Stowe. I'm from Kalamazoo, and I was a public Kalamazoo Public Schools teacher. And my husband was a Portage Public Schools teacher, and my sister and brother-in-law were Lansing Public Schools teachers, and my mom was a public school teacher in Kalamazoo, and my mother-in-law was also, so we come from a family of public school teachers. <laughs> and I loved it. I loved teaching in the public schools. I loved all my students, and um, I'm so grateful I had that experience. Um, and I, I, this issue was not not there when I taught back in 1965, 1970, around that area. My husband taught for 37 years after I did. We didn't even hear about this issue in the Kalamazoo area very much. So my heart goes out to you and I wanna, I'm anxious to hear everything you're saying and trying to find out what the situation really is. So I'm very grateful for everyone who has participated in this. Um, anyway, go quickly. <laughs> um, I. I was at the last board meeting, didn't get through much of my, a whole lot of my speech uh, because we only had three minutes, but uh, I want to go to my fourth point, and if I have time, I'll go back to one, two, and three. <laughs> so I make sure to get through this. I get information, my husband and I worked against pornography in the Kalamazoo area for years and went to Western and handed out materials to students and all kinds of things. So anyway, I get information from the uh, American Decency Association, which is in Fremont, Michigan. And uh, I got a letter from them just about a month ago and about the state board policy. I didn't know anything about it before then. And I got the May issue and found that, um, that the American College of Pediatrics uh, weighed in on this and gave some very strong statements. ACP.org, American, well, there's more to that. It's uh, www.acppeds.org. And uh, I'll quickly read through the, those statements. There's eight of them. Um, human sexuality is an objective biological binary trait. XY and XX are genetic markers of health, not genetic markers of a disorder. Two, no one is born with a gender. Everyone is born with a biological sex. Gender, which is an awareness and sense of oneself as male or female, is a sociological and psychological concept, not an objective biological one. Three, a person's belief that he or she is something they are not is at best a sign of confused thinking. Four, um, puberty is not a disease and puberty blocking hormones can be dangerous. My daughter's a doctor in Kalamazoo. She said she would never give these drugs to children. Um, Number five, according to the DSM, uh, as many as 90, someone mentioned this before, 98% of gender-confused boys and girls, boys, and 80% of gender-confused boys eventually accept their biological sex after naturally passing through puberty. Number six, children who use puberty blockers to impersonate the opposite sex will require cross-sex hormones in late adolescence. Cross-sex hormones, testosterone and estrogen, are associated with dangerous health risks, including, but not limited, to high blood pressures, blood clots, stroke, and cancer. Seven. Time's up. I'm all done? Yep, the three minutes is up. Sorry about that. Anyway, I'm giving this information to the Board of Education and the website for this, for this, for the American College of Pediatricians is www dot capital A, capital C, capital P, EDS dot org. So um, anyway, I'm looking to find out all I can about all these things for the sake of the students that I love, and I love them all, and they all love me. <laughs> Nan O'Meara is our next speaker, followed by Riley O'Brien. I'm going to pass this down to you. These are for the board members. Yep, also. that's fine. This is my twin sister. You <laughs> see. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm carrying a, I'm carrying a Bible, so <laughs> I hope I'm not judged for that. But anyway, um, what I want to say is uh, this scripture has been going around in my mind, and I, I want to say it for those people who are Christians because this refers to Christians. 
and it is Second Chronicles seven fourteen, talking about our nation. Uh, let's see, seven fourteen. If my people, that's Christians who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their own wicked ways, own is my word, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Our country needs a healing, that's for sure. Okay, and uh, my husband wrote me a beautiful note and he said, have a good day. Blessed are the peacemakers and reconcilers. Blessed are the forgiving and merciful. Okay, I'll just read this quickly. First, I think we're in the business of trying to help the kids get a good education in a peaceful, safe environment. I've been, I've been a teacher, grandma, and so on and so forth. Need to be, they need to be accepted and treated with respect as persons, you know, not according to any specific thing, everyone. They need a clean, safe environment to use the bathroom. So those are just simple principles that you would lead us. Um, I think we don't want to create problems in trying to solve other problems. So it is kind of, we don't want to interfere with personal privacy of some to accommodate others. Those choosing a different lifestyle should, I think we're, we need to teach those who are in the transgender, gay, lesbian, so on, just like we need to teach those who aren't, that they sometimes need to give. Um, they, uh, those choosing a different lifestyle should learn, just like the others, to accept others as persons who don't share their views and work along with what's best for everyone. That's the way it has to be in a school environment. We're all in it together, you know. Uh, the thing that I'm concerned about this policy is the deception. Um, it's never right to promote deception, uh, especially between parents and children and between schools and parents. Um, for example, this is just an example. Is it okay to teach children it's wrong to cheat on a test, but all right to deceive your parents? That will come across to children, you know. We want to work along with parents in raising their children with good values and good uh, preparation for life. I'll just have to say, oh, I got it right here. Um, we want to, so these I think are some solutions and then, okay, build trust with families and schools by, by trustworthy behavior. Um, establish a climate of love and care for each, for others and acceptance of others as persons. The administration, the teachers can do that in their building by promoting it among their students. Oh, shoot. Okay, provide safe times for, safe atmosphere for all and zero tolerance of bullying. I was thinking about this. For help for bullying, the person needs with bullying needs help and they need a counseling uh, session, so sessions. Uh, so uh, just you could keep them out for tell them for a month they're out uh, and they get their schooling at home and so on. It's just I don't know if this would work. And then try that again. Meanwhile, give them counseling regarding the bullying. Okay. And then this. Um, anyway. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Sorry about that, but thank you. Riley O'Brien is next, followed by Finley Beaver. Hello, and thank you kindly for allowing me the time to speak today. My name is Riley O'Brien. I'm an 11th grade student with the Neutral Zone in Ann Arbor, and I'm a gender nonconforming individual. Being a gender nonconforming high schooler comes with a good deal of confusion, misunderstanding, and fear, accentuating what is already a tumultuous time. For transgender students, the notion of high school being above all a safe place is a foreign one. In a rare minority within a minority, there is comfort in going to school. For the many that experience otherwise, the daily meeting with hundreds of peers is wrought with hazard. Every person I meet brings my gender into question. In the course of a day filled with sunshine, with temperate gusts, soothing colors, and no hardships in the periphery of my mind, there will be a dozen meetings. Each one is a new question stabbing at me piercing and prodding with assumptions where my gender lies. This part of myself is subject to harshness above all else. It is vulnerable where I least hope. It is erased where I wish only to remain. This is my daily turmoil, my threat and challenge, 
It is something I cannot ignore, for it pains me in every place I go. High school is where this shock, this injection of society, becomes numb. Not because it isn't noticed, but because, because it is so frequent, it mimics constancy. While this is in part due to the people, what burns harder are the never-faltering lists, attendance sheets, records, grade books, attendance, survey, school-issued email, attendance, grade book, substitute teacher, attendance. Each one carries with it the wrong name. And a push that much further from safety, serenity, a social normal which is wrenched from me in every place but my own. This guidance regarding transgender and gender nonconforming students is a rescue. Regarding the first and second transgender guidelines, this is a gift of that normalcy that the world has in bounty and I have in slivers. This guidance, which, might I add, makes me feel comfort and joy only known from nostalgia, its diction and consideration is an unfamiliar love. This guidance seems to take me by the hand and show me with every gliding step a path to a safer world a sprawling realm with the security and happiness I only see in thoughts. I see space for all the people I know and love and ever will, both present and future, made beautiful by giving me only that common safety. I implore you to take these steps. The power of a name and pronouns and the safety they provide are in your decision. I want to feel safe. Thank you for your time and thoughts. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Finley Beaver is next, followed by Mackenzie Rasmussen. Hi. Hi. I am Finley Beaver. Um, I'm a gender divergent high school student and a facilitator with Riot Youth in Ann Arbor, which is an LGBT activist group at the Neutral Zone. I don't speak for it. Um, as a facilitator and extremely vocal supporter of the community, I hear lots of stories about how, pe how the people I care about and identify with most are stripped of their identity and uh, harassed for shining. I have stories of my own. For example, I w being told I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't real because of my gender identity. I, even, I can't even feel safe in the stairwell because I'm afraid someone will push me down the stairs. I've been called har harmful names like he, she, which is just very rude and harmful and hateful. I've been explained to by teachers that uh, they, they weren't trans or homophobic, but that they weren't going to use my name or pronouns, which deeply affects how I learn. I, I, had, I very often don't do well in those kinds of classes. GLSEN reports that three out of four students are verbally harassed for their sexual orientation, one, and one in five report physical abuse. In terms of gender expression, 55% of students are verbally harassed, and one in eight are physically assaulted for it. NCAVP reported that LGBT identifying people are three times more likely to report rape. These numbers would be so much lower with this guidance in place as it would spread awareness and provide resources to these threatened youth. Um, I could finally feel comfortable in my school and be able to learn without fearing my peers and my teachers. The administration even makes me feel, you know, pretty agitated, a little scared, mostly scared. In response to the concerns of parental rights being taken away, I have two points for you. A, I understand that you think you'd be accepting of your child if they were LGBT, and even if they are, but remember that there are some parents out there that aren't. HRC reports that up to 40% of homeless youth identify as LGBT. Those parents do not get to control how their child feels in school and what they are called in the classroom. B, this is a guidance. It's optional. This, it's extremely important because a lot of schools that do want to help don't know how they can. And with this guidance in place, if they had this access to this, people like me could finally feel safe. It's completely necessary and makes me feel a lot of happiness. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Mackenzie Rasmussen, followed by Emma Heath. First, I would like to thank you for letting me speak today. And so I'm Mac Rasmussen, and I use they, them, theirs pronouns, and I identify as a gender fluid person. I'm here with an Ann Arbor group called Riot Youth, which offers a safe space for LGBTQ youth. I do not represent them, but I am part of their group. I myself have been out to my family, friends, and a majority of my community since seventh grade. I am not confused about how I identify. 
there has always been backlash for students who, are, who come out and who are trans and LGBTQ+. Plus. And if, in fact, the second paragraph on the second page specifically lists statistics about what happens to LGBTQ students. It says that students who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual are 2.3 times more likely to be threatened or injured with a weapon on school property and are 2.3 times more likely to skip school, skip school because they feel unsafe. When students feel unsafe, not only does it take a toll on their schoolwork and grades, it also takes a toll on their mental health. Based on the facts in this article, they are 4.5 times more <laughs> likely to attempt suicide. These numbers are already too high. If students are feeling, un feeling unsafe and threatened, then school isn't exactly a good learning environment. I believe that putting these guidelines in place will help reduce these horrible statistics. Right away in this document, it talks about the importance of knowledge of LGBTQ and trans terminology. I have tried myself many times to explain my pronouns to my teachers, and most of them don't understand what I'm talking about or what it means to use they, them, theirs pronouns. Now, this isn't their fault because not everyone knows and knows the information on, th on this topic, and that's fine, but we need to work on educating teachers and staff on these issues because the more they know, the more they will be better to navigate these situations. Another point made is on page five, item one, where it says staff should be address students by their chosen name and pronouns, regardless of whether or not it's been changed legally. This guidance is specifically important to me because I know from a personal experience how it feels to be in a new classroom or have a sub that day and be called by the wrong name and pronouns. It can feel like a panic attack or an anxiety attack. Your hands start shaking, you become sweaty, your chest even tightens up, it makes it more difficult to breathe. You feel vulnerable when you hear a name that disregards all of your progress that you thought you made. Every word is a gash, every letter is a salt in the wound. As you can see, these repercussions can't possibly be beneficial for students. So I urge you to listen and think over these, these guidelines. I feel strongly about them and they are important to me, my friends, people I love, and I hope that you consider all of us when making this decision. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Emma Heath is next, followed by Emily Hubble. Hi, my name is Kellen Heth. Um, I haven't changed it legally yet. I identify as mostly male and go by he, him, his pronouns. I'm 17 and I've been homeschooled since eighth grade. One of the reasons why I left public school is that I was miserable. I didn't know any better than to play the role of a heterosexual girl and it was exhausting. I didn't understand until years later that it wasn't normal to feel queasy when I heard my birth name. It took even longer to understand that not being a man doesn't automatically make me a woman because information about diverse genders had not been made available to me. Making available developmentally appropriate information and media designating a staff member who is both knowledgeable and friendly about LGBTQ issues, and supporting the formation of middle school GSAs, all as detailed in this position paper, would not only limit uh, or rates of harassment by straight and cisgender students, um, but uh, power questioning students and, well, help answer some of their questions. We've heard several parents, um, we've heard several parents so far today and in the session earlier, um, protesting the section about names and pronouns on page five, item three, I firmly believe that the choice in who is told what information should be solely in the transgender student's hands. Informing the school is one thing. Talking to your parents is wholly another. And the student may be ready to be called by their chosen name and pronouns far earlier than they are ready to, talk, to mention it to their parents. A smart and loving parent in this situation would say, I'm glad to see that I've been such a good parent that you feel comfortable opening, with me, opening up to me when you're ready. That's a boiled down version of what my mom told me. It's imperative that we don't assume that loving, non-abusive parents are the default here, because not everyone has that luxury. But above all, I'd like my friends to feel safe and respected in the place where they spend a large proportion of their days. But you don't need to take it from me. Take it from the people who would be directly affected by these guidelines. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Emily Hubble, followed by Jeffrey Murphy. Um, thank you for your time here today. This is probably really stressful for you guys. Okay. Um, my name is Emily Hubble. I am 18. I support these guidelines because it will help make schools a safer place for my friends. I do not attend public school, and I recognize that I am very lucky that I do not have to face the amount of discrimination that my friends struggle, struggle with in their schools. 
These guidelines will help make schools a safer and healthier learning environment by allowing schools to have the opportunity, because these are guidelines, to provide LGBT LGBTQ-based resources, including LGBTQ topics in the curriculum, which will allow people to have education and inform themselves on these issues. Um, if educating staff on how to effectively deal with discrimination in their schools and allowing students to use a bathroom that fits their gender identity. These guidelines will be incredibly beneficial to the safety and well-being of students. If students do not feel respected and safe, they cannot be expected to do well in their classes. Without these guidelines in place, LGBTQ students will not have the respect and safety that they deserve. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Jeffrey Murphy, followed by Canaria Williams, or Cat. Jeffrey Murphy. How about Cat? What? He left. He left. Thanks for telling me. Um, Kat Williams? Okay. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Kelner Williams. Um, I'm here with Detroit Represent. Um, I represent everybody. <laughs> I identify as a lesbian, and I'm just going to read something I wrote while sitting here. Um, children are children. No, they do not make their own decisions, but they do feel and have minds. They are developing and learning themselves. Children know what their parents teach them, and they become who they are by experience. I did not wake up and decide to be a lesbian. In fact, I kept it a secret for reasons I, w I knew my life was at stake. I knew I wouldn't be accepted. I knew people would treat me different, and I knew I would not fit in. I knew this because I heard my parents talking bad about LGBT people. And as a kid, I felt whatever my parents feel, that's what I go by. Um, they made me feel it was unnormal and wrong for someone to be LGBT or Q, questioner. So I was afraid of myself, but I am who I am. Um, if a child fears someone or believes they are just like, I mean, fears someone who believes they are just like them, um, someone who is at a stage of developing and someone who is learning and trying to live just like everyone else is because someone taught them it was wrong. So to be that way, I mean, so yeah, it was wrong to be that way. So passing this bill won't trigger an abusive child no more than a parent or an environment that is enabling causing that child to be abusive. Passing the bill will cause a lot of problems and um, solutions. When I first heard about it, I did not approve, but now that I heard everyone and I like literally heard everyone, everyone's opinion from what I believe, I think that it should be passed because um, I believe, like from hearing everyone's opinion, I think that no one wants to do the work. No one wants to see what's going to happen if this bill is passed. No one wants to like see kids. Of course, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be kids trying to abuse the right. It's going to be students that, you know, being mean and um, bullying on other kids. But that happens anyway. And I feel like it should be passed because they feel that it's important to them. And I feel like the bill came about because people, somebody t took the time to think about some the, the children. Somebody did take the time to think about the children. And I think that it is going to be a lot of, like, um, altercations due to this bill being passed, but it's definitely worth it. I feel like in the future, um, students will, it, be, it will become normal because right now it's not, it's a problem because it's not normal. And I, I don't want to see the hardships that all of my LGBTQ youth are going to have to go through, but I feel that it's necessary so that they feel um, accepted and feel like they're being treated equally in the future. That being said, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for being here. Thank you. James Jones, followed by Evan Murphy. James Jones here. James Jones. How about Evan Murphy? Lance Hicks. Here. And Lance Hicks will be followed by Mark Petzold. Hi, my name is Lance Hicks, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I brought a few youth with me here, and I grew up in the city of Detroit. 
Um, I'm a social work student at Wayne State University. I'll be starting my MSW in the fall. And I come to you today to talk about the fact that this bill, a lot of people have been talking specifically about um, the issue of transgender students using the ref restroom of their preference. While that's an important part of the bill, I don't think it's the bill in its entirety. Um, I've been working with at-risk youth for over a decade in the city of Detroit, and the majority of the youth that I have worked with are LGBTQ. Um, not all of them are transgender, but all of them have experienced hardship, and for many of them, that hardship begins in the classroom and in schools. Um, with the youth I serve, <coughs> many people think if you're a youth worker and a youth advocate, most of that work happens within the school setting. For me, that hasn't been the case. Most of the youth that I serve and with whom I work are not in school, and many of the time, much of the time that is due to the fact that they haven't been able to be safe in school, and so they've been pushed out. Uh, growing up, I came out as transgender when I was 15, and the community of young people that I connected with, who are my friends and peers, were not students that I met at school. They were homeless students living in squat houses and shelters on the street. In fact, many transgender youth in the city of Detroit don't go to shelters because even there, they're forced to be in gendered quarters that deny who they are and place them at risk, and they honestly feel safer on the streets of Detroit than they do in a shelter set up for homeless children. I'm concerned that if this bill is not passed, not only will it be throwing away a great opportunity to support students and ensure equitable access to education, it will also send an important and strong message to our students that they're not valued, that their safety is not valued, and not only in the classroom, but in life. As an intern, I recently served at the Student Advocacy Center of Michigan, and while I was there, and I do not speak on their behalf, but while I was there, I learned about the high number of sexual assaults that do occur within schools. So I want to acknowledge the concerns of those in the room who have mentioned the needs of sexual assault survivors. I think they're of the highest priority. In particular, when I was starting, one of my supervisors was working with a student who was a survivor of sexual assault. She was not transgender, she was not LGBTQ, and neither was her assaulter. She was pulled into an empty classroom and assaulted, and because of what happened, the school did not want to be found liable, and they sought to expel her. No one considered her rights, nobody considered why this had happened to her. She was criminalized and treated as if she had done something wrong when she was 14 years old and her assailant was 18 years old, and this happened on school property. The reason why I feel so many people are concerned about sexual assault in this instance is because transgender people are viewed as potential sexual predators. This happens, sexual assault against students in schools happens constantly in our state more than we want to admit, and it does not happen at the hands of transgender individuals. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Mark Thank Petzl. And Mark will be followed by Randy Block, or maybe it's Black. Hi everyone, appreciate your time. Um, you guys have been drinking from a fire hose all day today and I know you're not gonna remember everything that's said. So hoping to make one point that will stick with you and um, then you can go about your business. But I'm from Grand Rapids, I'm a businessman. I took, I'm a general manager. I took a vacation time today to speak for my uh, fellow citizens. And um, basically we, we do, in my groups we do a lot of uh, drilling down about our heritage and about the rule of law. And that's what I'm here to talk about really quick, is the rule of law. The uh, Declaration of Independence uh, states very clearly what the role of government is. The role of government is, or government is instituted amongst men to protect our God-given right to life, liberty, and property. So that's the right, or the life, liberty, and property of all the citizens, not just the special, uh, uh, group, okay. Um, we need to do both. We need to uphold the law, and we need to do it in love, okay. This is a. There's no doubt that the folks speaking here today, I'm sure they want to abuse the situation, but common decency is the purpose of law, so that uh, people can use the restroom and do it safely. There are a lot of parents that are very concerned about uh, people misusing the law, uh, subjecting their kids to dangerous uh, situations and um, you know that's what that's what law is for to have a civil society so again the purpose of uh, government is to protect our God-given right to life liberty and property and that includes the innocence of our children and the safety of our children thank you thank you for being here 